Good morning, everyone. Um, on behalf of the Women's Rights Law Reporter, um, welcome to our 50th anniversary symposium. First and foremost, I would like to thank our distinguished panelists and moderators for coming today and sharing their time and expertise. Um, I would also like to thank our keynote speaker, Mrs. Elizabeth Langer. She was our journal's inaugural editor-in-chief. Um, we are really delighted to have you all join us in celebrating women's achievement in the law, but also participate in this multifaceted discussions of women's rights and gender issues that are still prevalent today. We've made enormous progress and this day deserves to be celebrated for making such progress, but we know that we still have much to do. I hope that through discussions in, in the panels today, we'll be motivated as a community to fight for gender equality for all women of color, as well as members of the LGBT community. Our symposium is composed of three panels. First, the reproductive justice panel will address criminalizing pregnancies and our fight to access reproductive health care and abortions for childbearing people. The second panel is the incarcerated and detained justice panel. will address the different roles attorneys can play in advocating for marginalized populations who fall victims to the racially and oppressive criminal justice and immigration systems. And finally, the economic panel will address the impediments of economic justice for women in the workplace, including gender pay gap and weak protections for low wage workers. I would now like to introduce Professor Suzanne Kim, who's been so helpful in organizing this program. Uh, thank you so much, um, Young Jin, and everybody for being here. I want to particularly thank Young Jin and Janika and Priscilla Abraham and the whole staff of the Women's Rights Law Reporter, as well as the faculty advisors. Professor Emily Klein is here representing the faculty advisors as well as uh, Professor Sally Goldfarb. I cannot take any credit. The work really was done by these amazing students uh, who are uh, emerging leaders, already established, and also emerging leaders. And I want to really credit you for the incredible work that you have done. I know it has been a tireless effort, so thank you. Uh, I have the distinct privilege and pleasure of being able to introduce our keynote speaker for this morning, who is Elizabeth Langer, class of 1973 of Rutgers Law School, Newark. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about her uh, because I understand the paper programs are, will have more information, but I wanted to highlight some of the key features. Um, I am also just distinctly happy to have this opportunity to also get to honor the women's rights law reporter. I. Um, have worked with the Women's Rights Law Reporter several times in the past in 2015. I worked with the reporter to um, put together a gender equality symposium on the 20th anniversary of the United Nations um, Beijing Conference on the Status of Women. And in uh, 2009, I worked with the Women's Rights Law Reporter as well to put together a uh, day-long symposium to honor Rutgers Law School particularly just, uh, including Justice Ginsburg's uh, contributions um, in creating gender equality law. Uh, so I'm pleased to be here to celebrate the 50th. Elizabeth Langer entered L Rutgers Law School during the tumultuous fall of 1970 after having worked closely for the defense of the Chicago, at the con Chicago conspiracy trial, which was a highly politicized federal criminal prosecution against eight organizers of the demonstrations that took place during the 1968 Democratic Convention. And during her first year at Rutgers, she, as you'll hear from her, rescued a fledgling journal, the Women's Rights Law Reporter, from its imminent demise and brought it to its home here, to Rutgers, gathering an enthusiastic student staff, raising funds, uh, and securing its first faculty advisor, who was then Professor Ruth Bader Ginsburg, now, as you know, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, also known as RBG. <laughs> Upon graduating in June of 1973, Ms. Langer was hired as a legislative assistant to Congresswoman Bella Abzug, uh, from, Democrat from New York in Washington, D.C., where she handled the Nixon impeachment, women's issues, and FOIA matters. Following this work with Congresswoman Abzug, she became legislative director of the Consumer Federation of America 
1976, she joined the U.S. Department of Justice, the Civil Division as a trial attorney, and handled a variety of agency litigation in the federal courts. After six years at the Civil Division and uh, after time as senior counsel at Trial Lawyers for Public Justice, Ms. Langer opened up a solo practice in Washington, D.C. She built upon her earlier work in the area of women, women's rights uh, and worked in domestic relations, sexual assault, employment, medical and privacy issues, and civil rights. She also represented the people of Bikini Atoll in a series of suits for damages and injunctive relief arising from the U.S. nuclear testing during the 1950s. She was active in the Women's Bar of D.C. for many years, and with the help of the Women's Bar, created a cable TV series behind closed doors focusing on women's perspectives on domestic relations issues and then in, if that's not enough, after 20, in 2008, after 35 years of practicing law, Langer closed her law office, transitioned to her passion, uh, her other passion rather, uh, which is making art. So now she is a full-time artist. And um, I also wanted to note that this work that, she ta that she'll talk and share with you today is also mentioned in this uh, award-winning book from, published by my friend, uh, journalist, award-winning journalist Fred Streeby called Equal, Women Reshape American Law, and it talks um, about how uh, lawyers who early on were trying to develop the law of domestic violence actually looked first in trying to educate themselves to the women's rights law reporter and read back issues, not, there were not that many at the time, of the women's rights law reporter where they read... Um, about early gender battles, um, including Justice Ginsburg's work on the, the case of Reed v. Reed, Frontiero versus Richardson, and also Wendy Williams's work in Gedaldig versus Aiello. So without further ado, I'm very privileged to introduce Elizabeth Langer. thrilling to be here and to see that this little law reporter we started. <laughs> Here's the first copy from Rutgers <laughs> in 1970, first issue actually published in 72. We were hard at work on it and uh, it's still here and we're so happy, so happy that it's uh, survived all these years, 50 years, and is flourishing. When my son Ben was five years old, he arrived home from first grade one afternoon looking sad and dejected. What's the matter, I asked him. Why so sad? He turned to me with a puzzled expression and said, the teacher asked us what we want to be when we grow up. He shook his head. I don't know what I want to be. Hmm. Well, I replied, making an effort to confront the gravity of the situation with empathy and summon my best problem-solving skills, of course, learned at Rutgers Law School. <laughs> you could be a lawyer like your mother. <laughs> a look of utter dismay crossed his face. <laughs> oh, Mom, a lawyer? That's for girls. <laughs> He rolled his eyes, paused, looked up at me, and declared with conviction, I think I'll be a teacher like my dad. <laughs> I didn't know whether this was going to get laughs in this generation. But <laughs> that was 1980. And in Ben's very small universe of our family, girls became lawyers and boys became teachers. But heaven forbid that a boy should consider aspiring to a girl's profession. Sexism was rampant in our household. Dad drove carpool, that's dad over there, and made school lunches while mom prepared witness testimony 
for upcoming trials. Ben processed all this only backwards. Little did he know that this was a preview of the world to come. No, it's not here yet, but a world to come slowly. Ten years earlier, in 1970, Ben's mom entered Rutgers Law School as a proud but apprehensive member of the class of 1973. Think back to 1970. Hmm, most of you were not even born, probably. <laughs> There's maybe two or three. <laughs> so you'll just have to take my word for it. The idea of a woman entering law school in 1970 bordered on audacious. It placed her, us, <laughs> squarely in the category of odd persons, either extremely brilliant and not cut out for marriage children, or a troublemaker, or both. <laughs> in the fall of 1970, Rutgers was widely and affectionately known as the People's Electric Law School. The precise origin of that moniker is unclear, but it was the era of power to the people and there was a distinct aura of electricity in the, in the halls. As Bob Dylan had aptly proclaimed, speaking for our generation, the times are a-changing. Rutgers Law Newark had been a cauldron of political activism in the late 60s. The much-loved dean, Willard Heckel, had invited Arthur Canoy a revered civil liberties lawyer to join the faculty in 1965. Many young civil rights activists followed Kanoi to Rutgers. In July of 67, an urban uprising broke out in Newark led by the local black community. Newark was a majority black city controlled by white politicians. Racial profiling, redlining, Discrimination in employment and education all caused the city's minority residents to feel powerless and disenfranchised. The inner city was devastated that summer, and community organizer Tom Hayden, along with Newark attorney Leonard Wineglass, worked tirelessly to aid the local com black community in its efforts to secure racial justice. Dean Heckel's response to the political unrest was to appoint a committee tasked with the creation of a minority student program. The program was geared to the training of a new generation of indigenous minority law lawyers to serve the community. By 1968, Rutgers Law was leading the nation's movement towards clinical legal education. Having created the first large-scale student staffed clinical program, not without significant controversy among the faculty. The law school's reputation drew minority progressive and radical applicants. On campus, there was an active civil rights movement, an energetic anti-Vietnam War organization, and a growing anti-Richard Nixon sentiment among the student body and much of the faculty. I came to Rutgers directly from my work as an organizer and legal aide to Leonard Wineglass and renowned movement lawyer Bill Kunstler, the principal attorneys representing eight defendants in the celebrated political trial known as the Chicago Conspiracy Trial, also known as U.S. v. Dellinger for those of, uh, those of you who'd like to look it up. It was a highly politicized criminal case brought by the Nixon administration against key organizers of the massive protests at the 1968 Democratic National Convention in Chicago. Some were protesting America's involvement in, Vietnam, in the Vietnam War and the economic inequalities of the draft system. Others were demonstrating to promote the culture of the Youth International Party, a movement led by Abby Hoffman advocating street theater anarchy and cannabis over war. 
and still others joined protests to express their feelings that any semblance of the democratic system had irretrievably collapsed after the assassination of Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy in 1968. It was my work on that political trial alongside with Wineglass, Canoy, and many Rutgers Law graduates involved in the trial that brought me directly to the People's Electric Law School. Upon my arrival to Rutgers during the fall of 1970, in addition to the anti-Vietnam War protests, reverberations were felt from the killing of four unarmed students at Kent State University on May 4th, 1970. The Kent State students who were peace of peacefully protesting Nixon's invasion of Cambodia had been met with 67 rounds of ammunition from the Ohio National Guard. In response, student strikes were organized throughout the nation. It was a time of political and social turmoil. These political events nearly eclipsed another quieter movement that was percolating in 1970, the women's liberation movement. The emergence of this movement has been attributed in part to the surprise international success of Betty Friedan's 1963 book, The Feminine Mystique. Friedan, a housewife herself, describes what she called a problem with no name, the constraints that many women of that generation experienced in fulfilling the roles of mother and wife and the dissatisfactions experienced by educated middle-class women post-World War II who began to question whether the fault was with them or with the society. Women's liberation movement embraced the notion that it was time to rewrite society's rules, and feminists campaigned against social and political inequalities in an effort to end gender discrimination. In 1970, the entering class at Rutgers Law was made up of an unprecedented 20% women. It was said to be the highest in the United States. Once again, People's Electric was ahead of the curve, and the exhilaration among the entering women students that year was palpable. In our minds, we had reached a milestone in the journey to a new world. After all, ours was a generation born in the 40s and groomed to be housewives and mothers, or at best, maybe, teachers, nurses, or secretaries. Few of us had working mothers as role models. In high school, girls were tracked into home economics classes, while boys were offered woodworking and mechanical drawing. Girls were advised to enroll in typing and shorthand classes. Boys had a variety of varsity and JV sports. Girls were encouraged to be cheerleaders. In those days, there was no internet. Job searches were handled through help-wanted sections of newspapers. Employment opportunities were classified by gender. The professional openings were listed under help wanted male, while the clerical, nursing and elementary or secondary school teaching jobs were listed under help wanted female. To my knowledge, not one of my fellow women classmates who enrolled in Rutgers 1970 had arrived at Rutgers with a lifelong ambition of becoming an attorney. It was simply not an avenue of choice typically open to our generation. Because we were raised during the 50s and 60s, women entering law school in 1970 can be presumed to have a unique story. Many were st there were many stories, but all of them touch upon a common theme themes, how we arrived at law school, 
our mother's own lives and expectations for us, the obstacles placed in our path and our responses to those obstacles, what we absorbed and what we rejected in the legal curriculum, and how we altered a male-dominated legal profession, where we took our newly minted legal skills, the mentors who helped us on our journeys, and how we link ourselves to the generation of women law students and women lawyers today. My own story was one among many. As a child, I wanted to be a nurse. Until later in high school, someone suggested to me that girls could actually become doctors. At that time, it was a pretty radical notion. A reality check during my junior year of high school left a scar that in hindsight may have propelled me toward a legal career. I applied for admission to a combined college and medical school program at Boston University. In an interview with a senior male faculty member in 1963, I was told that although I was highly qualified for acceptance on the basis of my grades and SAT scores, the admissions office firmly believed that women applied to the medical school primarily to find husbands. My interviewer cited the impressive costs of a medical school education and concluded by pointing out that the time and money could be spent, that could be used to produce a male doctor would be wasted on a woman. He strongly suggested that I not bother to apply. Yes, sex discrimination in education was legal in 1963. More than legal, it was an open expression of accepted societal norms. Was I outraged? I should have been, but at that time I wasn't. That interview was yet another instance of what Betty Friedan had labeled the problem with no name. But the experience became another chapter in my story, the story that altered my direction and brought me to the realization that in light of gender inequities I had experienced, I wanted to take action. A law degree would likely be more useful than a medical degree. Another chapter in the story that brought me to law school, Rutgers in particular, was my experience in 1969 working for the defense of the Chicago conspiracy trial. As a volunteer, I began as a volunteer, but soon was promoted to paid staff. Not much pay, but some pay. <laughs> there, was a great, there was great media interest in the trial during, throughout the country. Early on, the defendants made a decision to use the trial as an educational and political organizing device during that trial, I made a remarkable discovery that law could be at once political, at the level of grassroots organizing, relevant to my generation, empowering, and intellectually challenging. Arriving at Rutgers Law in the fall of 1970, I took my place in an entering class of 320 more than 60 women were enrolled in that class, and for most of us, it was difficult to determine whether the uneasiness we felt entering law school was greater than our sense of triumph or utter dread. Working at the conspiracy trial had given me a degree of comfort with the law, but I was unprepared for the atmosphere of the law school. That year, there were two women tenure-track faculty members at Rutgers, Professors Eva Hanks and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and two women on the clinical faculty, Professors Anna Mae Shepard and Rita Bender. The remaining faculty members were male, many of whom appeared wholly unprepared for the sizable body of women law students entering, or maybe perhaps invading, the campus. The style of instructional banter from many of these men was sometimes crude and often sexist. 
My conclusion was that they were showing us that law was a male domain, we were outsiders, and that survival meant accommodating to their norms. To assuage my sense of discomfort, I joined a women's consciousness raising group. In the early 70s, these groups were being formed around the United States. They were informal support groups of women coming together under the slogan, Sisterhood is Powerful. Joining with a group of sympathetic women to discuss gender issues during a time of a rapid gender evolution and intense male resistance was both comforting and confidence building. Yet often these involved gripe yes, often these involved gripe sessions against our treatment by men. But in those days there was more than enough to gripe about. I found a consciousness raising group in Newark, right here, and there I was introduced to Anne Marie Boylan, a recent graduate of Rutgers Law School. At our first meeting, Boylan spoke about her efforts to establish a new journal, the Women's Rights Law Reporter, in her tiny Newark apartment. The notion of a legal journal focused on women's issues was a novel and fairly radical idea at that time. Boylan had managed to publish one issue, but she lacked both funds and personnel to keep the publication going. To me, it made perfect sense that the journal should be brought to Rutgers Law School. A number of other students agreed. Piece of cake, I thought. I scheduled a meeting with the dean at that time, Dean James Paul. After the meeting, I realized it would not be a piece of cake. The Rutgers administration was less than eager to embrace the new and financially troubled publication. And a law journal devoted to women's rights? What an absurd notion at that time. The journal simply did not fit any of the existing categories of law journals. We were told that Rutgers would provide neither staff Neither, neither, excuse me, neither funds, nor office space, nor an affiliation with the law school. Our only hope for keeping the reporter alive was to raise the needed funds ourselves, negotiate for office space, and find a faculty advisor who was acceptable to the dean. If these conditions were met, we were told there was a chance that Rutgers would allow publication of this fledgling journal. Fortunately, our then associate dean at the time, De uh, Willard Heckel, was far more supportive. He urged us to move forward with our plans. There was more than enough student interest among the women students to begin addressing the administration's conditions. Dozens of fundraising letters were sent out. We managed to secure a sizable grant from the Wallace Elgibar Fund and additional smaller grants from the Women's Division of the United Methodist Church, the Women's Center at Barnard College, and the Student Bar Association at Rutgers Law School. With the full support of Professor Anna Mae Shepard, the Urban Legal Clinic made space for the reporter in an old rundown building they occupied behind the main law school facility. After some discussion, not, not very much, <laughs> Professor Ruth Ginsburg this agreed to take on the position of faculty advisor. An advisory board was established, including Professor Arthur Canoy, Paulie Murray, and Eleanor Holmes Norton, and others. The dean's conditions had been met, and the reporter was permitted, permitted to publish at Rutgers Law School. However, even after meeting all these conditions, the administration directed that there was to be no mention of Rutgers Law School in the publication. Thankfully, that has changed. We assembled a staff of student volunteers, there were 19 of us, and made collective policy decisions. It was our consensus that the reporter would not be a traditional law review, but would remain as a law reporter, a clearinghouse 
featuring shorter articles and continuing case summaries, exclusively on women's rights issues. It was also agreed that the reporter would incorporate graphics, rejecting the look of a typical law journal. Our first issues were collective efforts, born of the 60s activism with conscious agreement to avoid the usual law, law review hierarchy. We sat around a large table and worked out the organization and content of our journal. Our first issue at Rutgers was published in the spring of 1972. The reporter was fortunate to have Professor Ginsburg as a faculty advisor. Through her ex though her expertise at the time was largely in the area of conflict of laws, comparative law, and civil procedure, and her scholarship that was published concerned Sweden's legal system. She had a deep interest in women's rights issues. She had developed a women's rights seminar at the law school and had authored the ACLU's brief in Reed versus Reed. As faculty advisor to the reporter, Professor Ginsburg devoted countless hours to writing and editing, counseling the staff, attending meetings, and inevitably mediating problems that arose with the administration. Her comment on Reed v. Reed appeared as the lead article in the first issue published at Rutgers. In the spring, by the spring of 1973, we had published three issues. There were 10 student editors and 35 students on the editorial staff. The process of bringing the reporter to Rutgers, working with Professor Ginsburg, organizing a cadre of students and faculty to support the publication, raising the necessary funds, and publishing the journal had a lasting impact on all of us. Many felt that the skills we had developed through our work on the reporter and our work on women's issues could be directed towards a career in the field of women's rights. It was an optimal path for post-law school employment. Shortly before graduation, I accepted a job with Congresswoman Bella Abzug of New York, a tireless and vocal advocate of women's rights. If you haven't heard of her, please look her up, Google her, because she's an important one of our predecessors. I was able to put into practice some of the theories and strategies we had espoused in the women's movement. Over the years, I have worked in various legal jobs, public interest legislative and trial organizations, the civil division of the U US Department of Justice, and finally, in 1984, uh, four, I established a private solo law practice dealing with many women's issues. After 50 years in and out of law, I can't resist the temptation to pass on a bit of advice. Let's call it a few life lessons that I've learned. One, volunteer. Even if you don't land the best job out of law school, you can always volunteer. Volunteering brought me to the Chicago conspiracy trial, which changed the course of my whole life. That in turn brought me to the People's Electric Law School and gave me the skills and confidence I needed to launch the Women's Rights Law Reporter at Rutgers. Two, rethink failure. Does that sound strange? Failure can and often does lead to opportunity and success. In 1975, I was fired from my position as legislative director of a public interest group after I missed a 7 a.m. meeting due to a severe case of morning sickness. That was with Ben. <laughs> Yet, at a legal, at, that was legal at that time. <laughs> Pregnancy discrimination. Unemployed for several months, I came to the conclusion that legislative work was not for me and decided to retrain myself as a litigator by joining the Department of Justice. It was excellent legal training. After nearly six years at Justice, I was passed over for a promotion when I contradicted the advice of a supervisor. Not a team player, I was told. Rather than continuing in a position with little prospect for advancement, 
I decided to open my own law office and employed, enjoyed a productive and challenging and successful legal practice for 25 years. Three, join your local women's bar. In 1978, the women's bar of DC sponsored a talk by Judge Patricia Wald. It was inspiring. Judge Wald told us how, after graduating from, I guess it was Yale Law School, and working in various legal positions, she took off 10 years to raise five children, after which she returned to legal practice, eventually being appointed to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. In 1986, she became the first woman chief judge of the D.C. Circuit. The notion of interrupting a legal career to have babies and returning to a successful career in law was, at that time, a complete game changer. During the 70s, we were told that success in the legal domain meant acting like a man. And the notion of a male lawyer taking 10 years off to raise children was unthinkable. The Women's Bar provided support, encouragement, and tangible business opportunities. Through the Women's Bar, I established a sole practitioner committee. We met monthly at my law office to discuss practice issues and agreed we would always send referrals to our women colleagues when we could, before our male colleagues. And it was also through the women's, through the sponsorship of the Women's Bar of DC that I was able to create both a column and a cable TV series behind closed doors, which was a look at domestic relations issues geared to a women's perspective. That series, in turn, brought many new clients my way and a significant uptick in business. Four, be an activist and stay an activist. We are living in an imperiled world now especially. There are many pressing issues facing us. Climate change, economic inequality, racial and gender discrimination, sexual violence against women, lack of quality childcare, and currently the subversion of our government into a near totalitarian state. Looking at the news, it is clear that the rule of law is under serious threat. In a, it is our job individually and collectively to actively resist the destruction of our democratic system before it is too late. I urge all of you to devote time, energy, legal skills, and monetary contributions to the democratic nominee, whomever that may be and to the down ticket congressional and Senate races. Canvassing, phone banks, letter writing, fundraising, registering voters, community organizing, your legal skills and energy are critically needed in the battleground states, one of which is right next door, Pennsylvania. Yes, we've made progress in women's rights. Fifty years ago, I could not have imagined a Supreme Court with three justices, a powerful and smart woman, woman speaker of the House, a woman secretary of state, a woman nominee for president in 2016, and multiple serious women candidates for the Democratic nomination this year, one of whom, Elizabeth Warren, entered Rutgers Law School in 1973, just after I graduated. Nor could I have imagined women police officers, bus drivers, sanitation workers, surgeons, CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, university presidents, or the enrollment of women topping 50% in law schools. 50 years ago, I could not have imagined the massive impact of the Me Too movement. 50 years ago, there were 11 women members of Congress. Today, there are 127. Progress has been made, but much remains to be done. 
The lessons we learned creating and nurturing the women's rights law reporter over the years have served us well. Women's legal issues have been at the forefront of political life during the past 50 years in Congress, in the courts, and in the executive branch. And the reporter has been there raising pertinent issues, analyzing gender-related cases, and providing creative strategies for moving forward. We're no longer required to follow male models in order to succeed. Creating and cultivating institutions for women to reach their full potential, our full potential, is what we as women did here at Rutgers in 1970, and what we must continue to do until gender equity is a baseline in our world. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Langer. Now we'll proceed with the justice, uh, reproductive justice panel. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Emily Klein. I'm an assistant clinical professor here at Rutgers Law. And um, I wanna welcome everyone to this special symposium marking the 50th anniversary of the Women's Rights Law Reporter. Um, this panel is on reproductive justice and we will be focusing on um, things like impediments to re reproductive freedom, um, which includes funding, criminalization, and how the laws in this country have particularly impacted women of color. Um, I'd like to begin by introducing our panel members. We have with us today Ms. Erin Michelle Williams, and Ms. Williams is a senior staff attorney for National Advocates for Pregnant Women, which is a nonprofit organization that works to secure human and civil rights, focusing on pregnant and parenting women, low-income women, women of color, and drug-using women. And we have Ms. Sylvia Enriquez. Ms. Enriquez is the co-director of All Above All, which unites organizations and individuals to build support for lifting bans that deny abortion coverage. They work in legislatures and in the courts, and they raise public awareness in order to make sure that every woman can get affordable, safe abortion care when she needs it. So the way we're gonna run this is I'm gonna give Aaron and Sylvia each about 10 to 15 minutes to discuss their work, and I think they both have um, actually some video um, clips to show as well, so we'll be doing that. Um, and then we'll go into a question and answer period. I'll ask some questions, and then towards the end of the hour, we'll open it up to, um, to audience questions. And Youngjin, do you wanna do that on index cards, or should we just, we'll see who's, has questions, we can just, we can just um, sort of raise hands and we have microphones if we need it. Okay, so um, let's begin with each panel member, member and we'll give you guys time to just talk about your work and your background and what you've been focusing on. So Ms. Williams, would you like sure. to go ahead? Hi everyone, hi future alumna. Um, <laughs> alum, what's the men version, what's the male version? Alumnus. Uh, alumnus, is it? <laughs> I'm not sure. There you go. Either way, <laughs> good morning. Um, I'm very happy to be here, very honored and humbled, especially as part of your 50th anniversary. Con anniversary. Congratulations to you all. Um, and I'm very um, happy to be sitting on the panel with Miss, with Sylvia, um, and a former Professor of mine. Yes, you realized. Erin <laughs> um, reminded me. When yes, she was. and it's okay. I teach Nine also. years ago, she was it's, my student. Yes, and, it's, and you didn't need to remember because I also teach and I don't remember anyone's name. Um, but I'm very, very happy to also be a part of a really important panel. And I'm glad it is aptly named Reproductive Justice and not a merely a, a reproductive rights conversation or panel. I think there is a big difference, and I will cue to that video, not in this moment, Youngjin, but very, very soon. Um, 
and I really appreciate our keynote kind of grounding us in where we are uh, in Newark specifically, um, where we are as far as the climate of politics, the climate of our rights. And I will, let me say this now before I forget, I will, when I'm when referring to um, people with the capacity for pregnancy, I will interchangeably use people and women because not everyone who has the capacity for pregnancy um, identifies as a woman, but also within that we understand a lot of those levels of oppression are related to, related to gendered issues, especially when we're talking about black women, um, which I am. Uh, and so, you know, I, I just wanna put that out there in the beginning before I forget, because I think that's extremely important. Um, and I wanna just kind of start with the fact that I did not start uh, professionally in the RJ or reproductive justice space, um, at least not in a formal fashion. And I say that, I, st I start there because I feel as if a lot of the students in the room may feel as if they have to know the answers to what they wanna do in life and in their career and secret, I still don't know what I want to do. Um, I came to law school knowing, however, that I wanted to play a role, small, big, medium size, in fighting inequities, inequalities, and injustices. So I started off um, clerking, well, outside of coming to, coming to New Jersey and coming to Rutgers in part because it is the People Electric Law School, um, because it is an a vibrant city, um, and because I'm originally from the South, even though you may not hear it in my voice right now, um, and most Southern girls want to escape the South for a few years, and that's what I did. Um, but I started off clerking in family court, and there were a number of injustices there in ways that I did not anticipate seeing. Um, and family court right down the street, you know, we, I saw probably for the first real time um, a chain gang in family court. Not, it did not, I didn't have to go to criminal court to see it. I saw 20 or so men almost every day being brought before the family court judge that I clerked for because they didn't pay for child support, um, which is an economic issue, which is a reproductive just, justice issue, uh, which is a civil rights issue in ways that we don't have that conversation. And I know we'll get to economic justice, but I think it's, it's great that we're starting with RJ because it incorporates literally everything that you're gonna talk about the remainder of the day. Um, and then I moved, I, I figured, I thought to myself, oh, this is insane. Like to, to hear people argue over money all day, to see people's children taken away from them um, by judges who do not look like them, who do not understand very important cultural things, um, and who are making decisions about a, a real fundamental right, which is to family, to be able to own it, to possess, to continue um, one's own family. And that was my first introduction without even knowing or having the terminology of reproductive justice. I just knew it was wrong, I knew it felt wrong, and I didn't expect that in family court. And I thought it was so crazy, I applied to be a, both a prosecutor and a public defender, the only two places I applied, because I was like, I have to get out of family court. <laughs> it's insane. <laughs> I'd rather deal with criminals um, or those charged. And I think I still made the right decision because I still think family court is an absolute, um, in many ways, ground zero for some of the worst things that our country continues to do. Um, and it doesn't have to just be at the border. It happens literally down the street um, every single day. So went to family, I went to criminal court and I, I accepted a position with the public defender's office. Um, shout out to Lois, who was one of my former colleagues and mentors. and worked there for several years doing what public defenders do, which is be ze zealous advocates for people who are unable to um, afford, who are indigent folks who are unable to afford um, private counsel um, and, and receive a, a wonderful experience um, on trial on a regular basis. Um, and yet again, seeing chain gang after chain gang of black men in particular being brought in to and out of court based upon um, a, num a variety of different allegations, right? Um, but I also want to bring into the space that I often saw women too, um, not only who were being charged with crimes, but who were their support system. Um, and was introduced in a way, because I come with a lot of privilege 
sociologists based upon education and economics, um, who brought, who were often supporting these men in particular, uh, but also were facing a lot of punitive measures at the hands of surveillance, at the hands of state surveillance specifically, and systems, whether that be through child welfare, again, through family court levels, or through their own criminal cases or probation, or just frankly the fact that they had partners or relatives or loved ones who were a part of it. Um, and all in all, the, whether it was people who identified as women or men, um, seeing in criminal court how everyone was just in control, right? Um, and the levels of injustice and the reasons why often were simply um, racism, uh, history, our, our, our undealt with history of slavery, um, and it was a constant perpetuation. Um, and I came to law school knowing, that, again, that I wanted to, to fight those injustices. And in really many ways, I wanted to be an impact litigator. Um, and I really think it's important to start by, through direct representation. Um, and frankly, part of the, one of the reasons why I decided to leave the public defender's office outside of my desire to do impact litigation was it became very exhausting every day to deal not with my clients who were frankly often very lovely even if they were crazy. <laughs> they were lovely people. Um, it, was the, every, it was the regular you know, day to day of trying to humanize people, to humanize my clients to people who did not look like them and sometimes even more exhausting to people who did. And that were prosecutors, those were judges, probation officers, what have you. Um, and so I was able to now um, move into um, a clearly more framing of a reproductive justice space. Because I'm not leaving that, the RJ conversation away from family court or criminal justice. That's what I think is so powerful about RJ, is that it is everything. Um, it is a, it's how we are dealt with as full people in every aspect of our lives are touched by it, especially the most marginalized communities. So I think the best way for me to kind of introduce this is through a video, um, because I think that's way more fun <laughs> than you hearing me talk. Um, and so what I'm going to, what Yunjin is going to play for you is a video from an episode, I always forget to say this because I'm sometimes too humble. It is an Emmy Award winning, a 2019 Emmy Award winning episode that I appeared on. Um, it's Kamal Bell's um, United Shades of America episode that aired last year, where initially, and please feel free to go watch it, it's really, really good, and not because I'm on it, because I think I'm only a small part, <laughs> and what made it absolutely dynamic. But he says in the beginning that he started off because of all that's been happening with abortion bans and all the stuff that I know many of us are aware of in the room, he started off wanting to have an episode on reproductive rights um, and how that evolved, and I'm very happy it did, evolved into reproductive justice conversation. Um, because I can speak only for myself that reproductive rights, whether in law school or frankly in life, never extremely appealed to me. It felt like a very white woman-centered, abortion-centered conversation that I did not see myself in. But reproductive justice is one that I completely feel aligned to. And so we're going to play the portion of me. I won't watch because it feels weird. <laughs> but it's, what it does do is lay out what reproductive justice is, and I think in a very digestible way. And it also kind of explains like what I'm doing now. Then we'll come back. I'll say a few words, and we'll play the video for you. You don't need to hear that much about me, OK? I, I muted it. Is it just working? Oh, there you are. Yeah, the sound is working. There you are. You sure it's not still muted? <laughs> And I really wanted to play because I'm unprepared to fill the next 10 minutes of time <laughs> talking. So we'll fill it. Yeah. <laughs> it looks like it's on. I mean, definitely play it early. Is the system up and running? I do too. Sometimes you have to reach right, for the back up. I came in early. Yeah. 
This is awkward. <laughs> yeah, he was here sit, hanging out at the front show, wasn't he, babe? I don't want it to, I feel that that kind of all of it for me. Because <laughs> um, it also gave case examples right. of everything. So why don't you guys just tell me that? Yeah. Okay. We'll, um, um, we'll try to bounce back to this. Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, sure, we can move to me, but I was going to probably yeah. oh, use you were reproductive too. justice like as a foundation as a rather than me defining it. I thought this was great. But you okay. know what? It's okay. We will, <laughs> we will keep moving. <laughs> all right. So I'll talk a little bit about All of All in the yeah, campaign. That would be great. And about like who I am and how I got into this work, yes. um, and then um, hopefully we can get our reproductive yes. justice grounding yes. in soon. Um, so my name is Sylvia Enriquez, and it's my pleasure and honor to be here today. Um, uh, I am not a lawyer. I never went to law school. Um, my degrees are actually in um, women's studies when it was called women's studies, so that I date myself in that, um, and public policy. And I went to George Washington University, um, and. That was um, my kind of um, professional entry point into nonprofit work um, was in DC. Um, but prior to that, um, my parents immigrated to the US from Central America and from El Salvador, and they came with a um, social justice perspective. And um, as people who are immigrants navigating um, society and navigating um, structural barriers and challenges, their stories are, have always been present with me. We, I grew up, um, not here, in, I'm a New Yorker, um, recently moved to New Jersey. So I grew up in New York and um, you know, there was just, um, and there, my parents are healthcare providers, so there was a lot of um, um, community focus and um, giving back and also bringing with you all of the struggles of their family from El Salvador and their own struggles as immigrants. And so when I um, went to high school, when I was in high school, I took a class and um, it was called Herstory. And um, it kind of did, was a moment for me to, to realize, oh, there's more to the, there's more to um, the US history than um, I've been aware of around women's rights, people of color, immigrant rights, et cetera. So that was um, a moment that um, opened up my eyes and then I was, um, you know, I had the privilege to be able to go to a university where um, there was a lot of activism. Um, so abortion became an issue that I personally um, became very active in because not at the time, not because of, of my own personal experience, but because it was one of the um, issues in my opinion based on what my parents saw in their home country that if, mm -hmm. if a person cannot control their ability to become pregnant and decide when and if to have a, a family, then really wh where is their autonomy? And regardless of how people feel about the issue of abortion, it's really about decision making and, and um, putting your family mm -hmm. first and making decisions that are in your, in your best interest. When I got into abortion rights, it was definitely not where it is today um, on a variety of levels but mostly in um, the reproductive rights field at the time because there really wasn't a robust reproductive justice movement when I started in this work. I've been doing this work for over 20 years at this point, so um, it really wasn't nearly as robust as it is today. Um, being able to carve out a space for women of color to talk about what abortion access meant for us was, was really um, challenging and it was, it was a moment where women of color could come together and say, now that we're talking about reproductive justice, finally, and meanwhile, we've all been carrying our entire families and our identities into this work all along, um, and you know, thank you to the women who actually 
coined the phrase, mm -hmm. put the work together to make it a framework that we can all hold, um, you know, we can actually talk about how abortion is also part of this reproductive justice frame. And it's not just about the right, it is not about Roe versus Wade only. Um, one of the things, and I, and I think we're gonna get some tech help soon, but one of the things that I'll um, pause with before we move to that is, you know, in when we talk about reproductive justice and abortion, we talk about, we don't talk about Roe versus Wade as it, we talk, we always say Roe is the floor, mm -hmm. what is the ceiling? And so that is the work of All Above All and our campaign, and that is also how we carve out strategies that center communities of color mm -hmm. in our um, struggle to actually reach the ceiling and, and imagine and sometimes re-envision what that looks like for our communities. So I'll pause there, um, and I think we're almost ready to start the video, and then we can kind of, if you don't mind, facilitate Yeah, and then we'll us flip back. back. And, yep. Yeah, of okay. course. Yep. And when you start, Angie, you can around 2.30, the 2.30 mark, not 2.35, I think is where the clock can be set. This is what usually happens in my classes too, so. <laughs> this is the bad part of being first. <laughs> Um, yeah, actually, maybe what we could do, um, because... And I, can, and I can say what reproductive justice is, I feel like it's at 4.30, so we can still try. Well, let's just give it a moment, and then... Maybe what we could do is, um, because you were both talking about reproductive rights versus um, reproductive justice, and so maybe that's something that we could define a little bit better. Um, what are those differences, and you know, sort of what do you um, what do you see as being the? It seems like it's a bigger picture regarding mm -hmm. reproductive justice versus reproductive rights. So maybe we could talk about, a little bit more about that. Sure. Concept. Uh, so reproductive justice is. Uh, uh, <laughs> no? Okay. I think we're starting over here. Okay, so reproductive justice is a, a movement a, um, and a phrase, but more importantly, a movement that was started by black women, um, and they were identified as black women. Um, many years ago, um, and I, I also agree that it's more robust now, um, and it, the definition of it is a rec in a recognition of people having the right, both a civil right, a human right, a constitutional right, to parent, to not to parent, to choose when they want to parent, and to do so with dignity and respect. And what that looks like is really like a good, a good set of case examples. Um, but really what it also acknowledges is that most people, especially People of color in this country, in particular black people, have not been given those that full opportunity. And a lot of our bodies, a lot of the choices that have, are being made for us, a lot of the surveillance, a lot of the criminalization that you know so many different communities experience are based in controlling their actions, controlling their community, controlling their ability to produce. And historically, really, when we think about what that, where that kind of started in this country, again, was with slavery. Right. Um, in particular, when we're dealing with women, um, but you know, not only just women, but mostly those women who carried uh, as enslaved people, it was about what they could produce for this body and how that benefited this country. And from that time, it has consistently existed in that way of how can we control your body, how you, can you produce something for it, and how can we make sure that it is done in a way that benefits um, the majority. Um, so like that is kind of like where RJ and reproductive justice, which is RJ, is kind of grounded. And what that continues to look like in the systems that people find themselves in that have continued to control them, and more importantly, how we fight back against that. Um, and uh, I think the, the initial, the keynote speaker, referenced something about how, you know, 
that now in particular, and, and frankly since the 70s as she's described, you know, so many people, in particular women, and I, I feel as if sometimes when people say women, they're really specifically referring to white women, experience that rights, you know, were are, are really being pulled back on or curtailed. And I think one thing that black people in particular, uh, people of color in this country also um, know, and black women especially know still today, is that the, the, the span of rights, the protection of rights have never really applied to us. And so what does that mean? That what that means is that they have to shape, we have to shape it ourselves. We have to fight back it against, against it um, and helping develop that. And that is, uh, again, where reproductive justice is grounded in a way that I feel um, the, the feminist movement in particular has not centered the, that experience. An extremely important conversation, but is often centered in only abortion, um, not that reproductive justice does not include abor abortion, because it does. Um, so that sounds, Sylvia, like something you have you have written about, which is that um, sort of the feminists of the of the sixties and seventies um, used the concept of choice, mm -hmm. right? But that that doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. um, embody. Um, the concepts of reproductive justice and, and the experiences of women of color. So if you could speak a little bit about that as well. So um, the way that, that um, we've been, I guess, implementing the foundational framework and belief system of reproductive justice through our campaign, through the All Above All campaign, um, is specifically to shift culture and narrative and language. Um, we are one of, uh, you know, we're a coalition of organizations that have been working to dismantle how people talk about the issue of abortion. So it is not, we, you know, we've really moved away from talking about it as being pro-choice. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because it is limiting and it doesn't, ac it actually assumes that there was a choice that we had at some point. Mm -hmm. um, and we actually, as women of color, people of color did not. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so for us, you know, not only is it about reimagining what the ceiling looks like for abortion access outside of a Roe versus Wade legal framework, but also is can we actually talk about being pro-abortion access? Can we actually talk about being pro-reproductive justice, including abortion, um, and not just put it put it in this um, you know pro-choice anti uh, pro-choice anti-choice framework? And you know, for many people, a framework is a framework, but actually, you know, words matter, and it's and the way that people are. Um, categorized within that doesn't actually leave room for the gray um, and the more nuanced approach. Because especially for, for um, historically in communities of color, um, speaking, um, you know, I used to be the head of the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Health, and when we talked to immigrants, um, Latinx and Spanish speaking folks about abortion, it was always like, well, do I have, is it all or nothing? And for us, it was a continuum of conversation. It's about, sure, you, you don't have to, nobody is saying that you need to agree and, go and, and say, yes, this is what I'm gonna do with my body and my decisions. It's really about supporting community, supporting other people and making their decisions when they find themselves pregnant and, and don't actually want to continue with their pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And so by being able to unpack the conversations around abortion access and, what, and, and unpacking that the barriers that people actually have to access are not just barriers to abortion, but are mm -hmm. barriers to being able to live their full lives and in their communities in a safe way and in the way and with dignity, um, that really op also opens up the conversation. So all of these different um, cultural shifts and narrative shifts that All Above All has been doing um, over the past, we've been, our campaign has been, um, we started about 10 years ago um, and, over, and, and five years ago, we long, launched our public facing campaign, which is all of all. And so we've been working to dismantle who, who are the voices, who's at the center of abortion access, um, and, and what are the strategies and what are the policies that center communities of color, back up, <laughs> centering <laughs> communities of color, um, and really gets us away from a very limiting rights-based frame mm -hmm. um, when it comes to abortion. So I can, again, pause there um, mm -hmm. and happy to also talk about some of the strategies and including Each Women Act and all that later. Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so back to you, Erin, something you said, Sylvia, you said there were, you know, re reproductive justice includes something 
um, like barriers to dignity, not just barriers to um, abortions, right? And so um, that's something I know, Erin, you've been working with, you were talking to me the other day about the practice of public hospitals, drug testing, uh, mothers without their knowledge and consent when right. they come in. And so that sounds like something that sort of is in line with, with that concept of barrier to Correct. dignity. So maybe you could tell the audience of what that is, sure. um, why that's done, the legal basis for doing that, and how it impacts. Um, sure. Um, and I probably, again, I thought the video would handle this, but I'm going to yeah. also start we'll with just, just explaining. <laughs> yeah, I'm just, I'm just going to explain also what NEPW does. Again, it's a, it's a, a, na a national nonprofit that uh, has state-based projects. And my state-based projects are in Georgia, Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, and Oklahoma, which is not the South, but something like. <laughs> um, and so as much as I thought I was escaping the South, I spent quite a great deal of time there working to help people who either represent people who were charged, pregnant people who were charged with crimes related to their pregnancy, or directly representing people who are um, experiencing criminalization because of their pregnancy. So what that looks like is a good example of what's occurring in Alabama. I'm sure many of us are somewhat familiar with Roy Moore um, and all that he is <laughs> or tries to be. Um, but even outside of Roy Moore, there is a law called the Chemical Endangerment of a Child Law. That law was a uh, legislatively intended to apply to people who had their children. These are live-born children, when I refer to children. Um, their children brought into dangerous chemical environments like meth labs. I have issues with many different levels of prosecutions, including it under that guise, but nevertheless, that was the legislative intent to prosecute people who brought them in there. The way that the law is being applied- What side of the issue you are? I think we all have to agree Ooh, that this yeah, and you're excited as I am. totally fucked. <laughs> Let's see what happens. I don't no, want to get too excited. Been, but no screen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't see any of Reproductive <laughs> justice is a social movement started by women of color you, that includes and, and reproductive rights, but it also looks at <laughs> the right to have a child, yes. the right to not have a child, the right to parent the children you have, the right to control birthing options, the right to affordable health care, reproductive rights, is just a small oh, part right. of a bigger discussion, reproductive justice. So let's talk about the difference. Reproductive justice is a social movement started by women of color that includes reproductive rights, but it also looks at the right to have a child, the right to not have a child, the right to parent the children you have, the right to control birthing options, the right to affordable health care, the right to comprehensive sex education, and much more. And it doesn't just focus on cisgender women, it includes trans and non-binary folk as well. Some of you are out there Googling right now. <laughs> but for some people, all that matters is the fetus. I believe all human life, irrespective of the circumstances in which it came into being, is worthy of the protection of our laws. Thanks, Marco. And here's why what he said is a problem. If you are a pregnant woman, because there's this concept that what is inside of you is more important mm -hmm. and is a separate person with separate individual rights, mm -hmm. you can be arrested, criminalized, or prosecuted. If there's death to a fetus or any type of harm, so when you really think about it, 15 to 20 percent of women who become pregnant experience a pregnancy loss. So all of these women, whether they have an abortion, whether they have a miscarriage or stillbirth, all benefit from Roe versus Wade and are all deserving of their constitutional rights, their human rights and dignity and respect. But Preach. they're not getting it. Yes, yes, and that's where you come in. <laughs> yeah. This is Erin Williams, senior staff attorney at National Advocates for Pregnant Women. Her job is to fight against the criminalization of pregnancy, which is a phrase too crazy to even admit is real. So when we're talking about Mississippi specifically, so Latisse Fisher is a Mississippi woman who is poor, who is black, and a mother, and a wife, and she experienced a pregnancy loss, specifically a stillbirth at home. Timahawk County Grand Jury indicts a mother. The crime she's accused of committing? Killing her newborn. And there are a lot of different reasons why woman in her situation would have a home birth. But what is happening, because of this concept that if it comes out of your vagina, you're responsible for it. You have to guarantee everything is perfect about it. <laughs> She's being prosecuted and criminalized. Yeah. And that's also true of a lot of other women, like the case of Angela Carter, who was a woman in DC who had been battling cancer for off and on for many years, and she ended up being pregnant. The hospital, because she was pregnant, she was six months, about 26 weeks pregnant, decided, 
we have to save the baby. We can't save her. So over her objections, over her family's objections, over her treating OB's objections, they got a court order, performed the cesarean surgery. The baby came out, only lived for two hours. And she died two days later. That's DC, that's not, that's not Mississippi. And that's why like, I don't want anyone to think this is just Mississippi. I don't want anyone to watch a show and be like, oh, this is just the South. Yeah. Like, we're not Dre in New York. 35-year-old Renat Dre is the mother of three boys. Her first two were delivered by cesarean section, which involved difficult recoveries. So in 2011, she was determined to have Yosef naturally through a procedure called vaginal birth after cesarean, or VBAC. She talked to her doctors about it all on board. And she goes in to have it, because these are different doctors. Like, no, 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 we want you to have a cesarean surgery. She says, I don't want it. They go back and forth. They literally come out, tie her down, they cut her open, and they puncture her bladder. I know, that was, when I, listen, when I, when I heard this, I was like, where am I? Wait, wait, <laughs> where am I? I thought, oh, I'm in the United States. I'm in the, yeah, I'm in the United did States. I, did I walk into the Handmaid's Tale? What's happening? Like, what are we turning into? <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's what we have to think about. It's like, like, you got, like, we have to think about, what is wrong with us as a yeah, whole? Yeah, I'm like, look at like, Where do we get broken? It's like, that's what called me to this work. It's not yeah. just like abortion work, but the ways in which I can be impacted by this ideology of women are supposed to put aside everything. And constitutionally, if you think about our constitution and gaining constitutional rights. When the 13th Amendment was ratified to the states, enslaved people were added to the constitution. White men who were in power did not lose their rights, though. If we add fetuses, embryos, or fertilized eggs, to the Constitution and say that they are persons, that they are personhood, they deserve constitutional rights. There is no way not to subtract a woman. She will not have her right to liberty tied down. She will not have a right to privacy ripped open. She will not have a right to free speech or due process or equal protection. So that you are literally ripping a woman out of the Constitution, which is the opposite of what Roe did. So, I mean, what you're talking about is what I've learned recently, the difference between reproductive rights and reproductive justice, mm -hmm. which is not something I'd ever really understood as being different, and that we're not looking at this in a 360-degree way. Yeah. You hear reproductive rights, and you say, oh, well, that's abortion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't need to think about abortion. It's put beautifully by Audre Lorde, who says that there is no single-issue struggle because we are not single-issue people. Yeah. If you want healthy babies and you have to take care of the woman, you have to make sure she's healthy. You can't just focus on poverty mm -hmm. and generational poverty without also thinking about the wage gap or also reproductive health care, not just rights. Yeah. All of these issues intersect, and we, ha we can't just deal with one. The fact is, is that you can see all those things come together, all the inequities and injustice mm -hmm. of America come together in the body of one pregnant woman. Stop the patriarchy. Stop the patriarchy. <laughs> Thank you. Cheers. It's great. Oh, it's really, it's really great. Oh, good. I think that was a good way to just kind of like, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. Sylvia, um, do you want to go and try to set that I'm up? I'm not going to. Okay. Fine. Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. I think this is great. It works really well. Okay. Um, so, so we can move on to, I know one thing that we wanted to talk about, um, and Sylvia, that you've been working on a lot is, is the Hyde Amendment mm -hmm. and um, sort of how that affects um, women of color in particular mm -hmm. and, and, mm -hmm. um, and sort of wraps itself into the concept of reproductive justice as well. Yeah, so I was going to, um, yeah, so let me do that. Um, so the Hyde Amendment, um, the reason why our campaign started um, is actually um, in response to the ACA um, in 2010. When the Affordable Care Act was passed, um, it obviously ensured affordable health care for people in this country. And in many ways, you know, it was one of the greatest accomplishments. Um, and it did leave out two specific services, birth control and abortion. Um, so the, at that time, um, and this is, I think, very apropos to what you were just saying in the video around reproductive justice, um, many of the national reproductive rights organizations said, well, we're going to go and get birth control covered, but they didn't want to do, they didn't want to include abortion mm -hmm. because it would mean 
that they would actually have to end the Hyde Amendment, which is um, the amendment that bans federal coverage um, for abortion. So anybody who is in any kind of government insurance program cannot get an abortion. And that includes people who are on Medicaid, it includes people who are in the military, it includes um, people who live um, in indigenous communities and are in, in Indian health services, it includes people in the Peace Corps, um, and it can include any one of us who is going to need government insurance at any moment in our, in our time, right, and in our lives. Um, so so um, many reproductive rights organizations said, you know what, the time is not now. Mm -hmm. Let's keep it moving with birth control. So a group of women of color leaders, and I say women specifically, um, women of color leaders, um, we got together and said, well, we need to come up with a campaign because it's actually been, um, at that time, since my math is right, about 30 years, um, that the Hyde Amendment had been in place. It came in place in 1976, um, Henry Hyde, um, three years after Roe versus Wade, um, Henry Hyde, who is, was a member of Congress at the time, said that this, you know, that there was no way that um, the government would ever pay for women's abortions. And so um, the amendment has been in place ever since and it gets um, revisited every year during appropriations when um, you know the, the con when Congress um, has to decide on its budget and how it's gonna spend its money. And um, it's a consistent ask of every president that ever gets in office to actually demand that, they're, that they take out the ban on abortion um, coverage and it never happens. <laughs> um, and, and we're getting closer. But that, so our campaign started because that was really the very specific policy goal that we had. Um, so and so part of what makes it a reproductive justice campaign is one, it was a group of women of color who centered our communities and said, you know, actually it is time. Um, we ended up having to negotiate a lot of coalition politics because other organizations with a lot more resources and a lot more money did not want a, us to do this. Um, this was 10 years ago. There were maybe like six organizations that got behind us. Um, now we have over 100 organizations that are part of our campaign. Um, we've got state groups and, and national groups as well. Um, it's predominantly still um, led by people of color around the country. Um, and you know we have actually um, done a great deal to shift and change narrative how the field, our field of reproductive health rights and justice is actually looking at this issue and people aren't seeing it as this like controversial not now issue. Um, and so for us, it's, reproduct it's a reproductive justice issue because eliminating economic barriers to um, abortion care actually opens up so many other opportunities for people to live their full lives. Um, and so, you know, the connection that we have with economic justice and abortion access is so critical, we can't do one without the other. And that is part of what makes doing this work under reproductive justice is very different than if you had an organization or a campaign that really was just looking at under reproductive rights because we are able to look at the connections around economic justice, who is actually impacted low-wage workers. Um, so we can partner with Jobs with Justice or Fight mm -hmm. for 15 groups to say, you know what, this is all of our constituencies are equally impacted. Um, we talk about this issue as something where we center people who are making, um, struggling to make ends meet. And the reason why we say that is because we believe any one of us who are not the 1% <laughs> Are, could potentially be in that category of struggling, struggling to make ends meet. You know, we get laid off from a job, we lose our health insurance, somebody gets sick. I mean, there's so many things that can happen in our lives that we feel like it's actually a constituency and a core where we should, many of us should actually feel like, yes, that could be me at any moment, or my kids, or my friend, my neighbor, my sister, mm -hmm. et cetera. So those are some of the reasons why we um, address it in the way that we do. Um, Want me to say? Yeah, you want to talk about the Each Woman Act sure. and, and sort of yeah. state legislation as well that's being Great. enacted. Thank you for the prompt. Yes. So, um, <laughs> so that's the campaign, and so the work that we do is both the state and federal, um, as well as um, field organizing. So, how do we actually shift and change um, narrative and culture on this? It's been, you know, a ten-year process. We, because um, the systems were not in place for us to just say, okay, here's, here's how we're gonna move this effort. We actually created our own bill um, on the federal level that would reimagine what it would look like to actually lift bans um, on, you know, on abortion. And so, um, you know, it's, it's for us, um, you know, I'll quickly kind of share just because um, as um, law students language is important for you all. Um, so the overarching goal of the Each Woman Act is to ensure that every 
um, woman, person, has health insurance coverage for abortion care, however much they make, however she gets her insurance or wherever they live. So for us to be able to, to eliminate geographic barriers is the key piece. For us to be able to talk about government insurance as insurance um, is also trying to shift narrative. Um, so ultimately, if the Each Woman Act moved through Congress, um, it would ensure that people who are on Medicaid um, would actually be able to get their abortion paid for. Um, and it ideally prevents politicians from interfering um, in women's and people's decision making. Now, we don't say government interference because we actually want the government to support and pay for abortion. So we actually say politicians because it's ultimately individuals who are denying coverage. Mm -hmm. um, so where is the Each Woman Act? And it's so the other thing, you know, it, it is what we call a message bill, which means that it's really about shifting culture and educating legislators to be able to soften the ground for a time when we can actually put some concrete policy shifts and changes to Medicaid, because we would have to change Medicaid, there's a whole other list of things. But the but at this point, it does signal support, right? So we've we have it's been introduced in the House and it was recently introduced in the Senate. And we have on the House side, you know, over hundred co-sponsors. So it's some it and this is not something people would have imagined five years ago. Um, certainly not 10 years ago. And so the fact that members of Congress are using this as a platform who, to indicate their, and signal their support for abortion and reproductive health and rights issues is really huge. That also translates to how candidates, mm -hmm. you know, in the presidential um, field mm -hmm. are talking about this issue. We, we use this as a platform to educate and shift the way every single person who has um, put their name in in a Democratic ticket to be able to talk about this issue. And it doesn't become an issue where people all the time. Sometimes they still stumble, but um, it, you know, it's certainly not not an issue where people are wondering, oh, where do I stand on this issue? Here's here's how you should stand on it. Here's why you should um, support this, and here are the people behind these efforts. Um, so what is working is if we look at the state level advocacy. So we at All Above All, we have this federal bill. It's a vision bill. It's a message. It's education. It's changing culture and narrative. It's organizing people. What can we actually shift? How, where can we actually change policy? It's really on the state level. Um, and so we've, we have, there are two states where we've been able to move a proactive um, bill that actually does lift the ban on Medicaid coverage for abortion. One of them is in Oregon and the other one in Illinois. And they're slightly different bills, but ultimately um, in Oregon, we call it the um, Reproductive Health Equity Bill. And it is asking um, the, the, the state of Oregon to ensure that anybody, included undocumented folks, who want to get an abortion can get it through Medicaid. Um, and that has absolutely shifted and changed the way people look at this issue and who can access it. Now, there was a moment where um, you know, there was a ballot initiative recently to try and repeal it. That was defeated, and so the bill remains. Um, and so for us, on our campaign, what was important is, one, ensuring that this bill on the state level includes all people that could be potentially, um, that could potentially need to get an abortion under Medicaid. Two, it went beyond just abortion. It was actually, it's called the Reproductive Health Equity Bill, so it opened up the door. If, if they were saying, okay, fine, we'll cover abortion, we were like, well, that means that you can actually cover all these other issues that people perceive as, quote, unquote, less controversial. And ultimately, you can also include immigrants and undocumented folks. Um, and then, but I think the work that we did as a reproductive justice campaign was not just about writing the piece of legislation and getting it moving, but actually building a coalition of, of folks of color, folks from a variety of movements, immigrant rights, racial justice, groups in Oregon to be able to coalesce and to be able to make sure that they were all aligned with this vision. Because when it gets attacked, which it did through this ballot measure, the coalition could actually come together and say, no, 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 our people still want this and we still want to make sure that this bill remains. And so that required changing um, who was actually leading the charge. It wasn't going to be NARAL, it was going to be a person of color, RJ organization leading the, you know, so you had to shift power, so you have to shift agendas, who's setting the agenda, who's at the center, and who's moving these strategies. So that for us is what, it's what it looks like to do re, um, policy advocacy work using a reproductive justice frame and lens. Great, thank you. Erin, um, back to you. 
on a more individual level, we before the video we mm -hmm. were starting to talk about some of the laws that um, you know criminalize um, certain behavior yes. with pregnant women. Yes. Um, and and you personally, your organization has represented it, represented some of these women. Correct. Um, and so maybe you could speak to to that a little bit sure. more in more detail. Sure. Um, I think so. I think where I left off was describing what was occurring in Alabama. But, um, and which is specific to the Alabama law, but I also want us to know that what is occurring there also happens in New Jersey. And, and more specifically, that is pregnant people going into healthcare settings and being tested, drug tested without their consent. So again, or their knowledge. Um, so again, in Alabama, well, let me, let me start still where that is. So what that means is even in New Jersey, if I were pregnant, um, I could go into a hospital setting of seeking prenatal care or delivery. And we all sign those blanket waivers. We never really read them. Everyone knows that. Um, but, and, and often we are consenting to a number of different of, of policies and testings and, and all those kinds of things. Um, where that becomes problematic when you are pregnant is that it is unfortunate, not only in Alabama, but most places, that people see that you are a caring child and I'm not disagreeing with that in, in, in a lot of sense, but where they see that is that it, they have to, there's a protection that they have to have, not only of you as potentially their patient, but also of that fetus embryo or in some circumstances, the fertilized egg. So where that comes, what that can look like is if you test positive for a drug. Um, and I think this is an important point to, to mention that um, a lot of the work that I do uh, is centered around still fighting and dealing with the stigma of the war on drugs and how that applies to black, brown communities still, in particular when we're looking at women um, as they're parenting or pregnant. And more specifically, the like crack baby myth, which many of us, I think, in this room grew up in. And even if you did not grow up in it, you were still dealing with that. Uh, even when we're thinking about like oxytots or the whole opioid crisis or epidemic, often that face are the most vulnerable of, the, of, of communities or populations, which are pregnant people and children. And, 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 and frankly, many of us just naturally believe that anything you do when you're pregnant automatically impacts all of your, of your pregnancy and potentially your child, right? And so some of the, and that, what that can come into doing or, or looking like is if you test positive in a healthcare setting, you can end up with the child welfare case or in some states, not only Alabama, with a criminal case. And those criminal cases can look like a child neglect. They can look like distribution of, of marijuana, <laughs> you know, distribution of drugs through your umbilical cord. It can look like possession of drugs by you literally just ingesting and because you are pregnant. And it literally is insane. Like, I know, it's crazy. I did not realize that this existed at the volume or the breadth across the nation because we have this... Um, Again, the stigma of these beliefs that we have to protect um, the child first and foremost, the pregnancy be before that person. Um, and so on a, on a legal level, that, those are, that's a violation of these people's rights. Um, when I, as I sit here and non-pregnant and I go into a healthcare setting, if I test positive, I am not going to generally be reported, generally. Because um, again, there's some there's different layers to answering this uh, when we're dealing with socioeconomic background, race, that kind of stuff. But generally speaking, I'm not going to you know be reported um, to child welfare for sure or to a law enforcement body just because I tested positive. There's only one state, South Dakota, that actually criminalizes drug use alone, right? So in most states, drug use alone is not criminal. The possession, the distribution, the manufacturing, the possession, that is, mm -hmm. which is why those laws are applied in that way to pregnant people about a distribution, a child mm -hmm. neglect, mm -hmm. a possession um, in non-South Dakota mm -hmm. states. So there's a violation of my privacy when I'm seeking health care. And this is more specifically applied to women and people of color. Because when this is generally when we're dealing with uh, a white woman in particular, especially if she is of, of has decent, uh, a decent wealth status um, and is not on Medicaid or Medicare, 
if she tests positive, what will occur to her is that there will be a conversation. Are you using? Was it just once? Was it a mistake? Do you need treatment? Those kinds of things, which is I, I actually support. There should be conversations with patients, no matter their pregnancy status. Um, but what occurs later for generally that white, wealthy-ish, um, or stable, economically stable person, is then after that, if they are married, if they have um, access to treatment, and I also always, I think it's always important to mention that drug use and drug abuse are two different things, right? I, I always like to say I have used drugs. <laughs> that doesn't mean that I've abused them, mm -hmm. even if I'm pregnant, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm, I may use, you know, I may use marijuana, I may use um, an oxy for an, a lot of different reasons, and that does not mean that I actually abuse. Nevertheless, they will have those conversations with people. If you look a particular way, if you come from a certain background. Now, when we're dealing with different populations of people, often what will happen is that they will just be tested, and then child welfare services will be involved. And then, depending on a lot of different circumstances when you're dealing with law enforcement bodies and prosecutions, um, they could end up in criminal court. But if, even in the center of that child welfare services involvement, that does not only mean that potentially that newborn, who may also be tested without the parent's consent or knowledge, um, could be taken away, but also that it exposes the entire family to potentially years worth of involvement and surveillance based upon a drug test, right? And, and one thing that my, stop, got you. Um, <laughs> no, it's okay, I didn't have to say it out loud. Um, but you know, one thing that, you know, that my um, EB often does, um, I don't do is she, she brings in like this little bottle or this like cup and she holds it up and has her urine in it. And she says to everyone like, this is how we're deciding who is a good parent or not. This is how we're deciding, you know, how who goes to jail or prison potentially when we're dealing with pregnancy in certain places. Um, and, and just to throw out also, not only is it a violation of people's privacy rights um, and due process rights because you don't even know that you are under that class of people that could be considered child, you know, someone who could be exposed to child neglect because in most states, even child does not expand to pregnancy, right? Um, but also these are violations of people's um, Fourth Amendment rights. I'm not, I'm not given, th this is a search upon my body, and I'm not being told that I'm going to be searched, I'm not, be, I'm not consenting to it. So it's so many different layers that is often not a part of the conversation, and what often results for a number of different reasons, including you may have literally just had a baby, and your baby is being taken away from you almost immediately, or sometimes um, you're able to go home and then the results come back, um, and then your baby, your newborn, may be taken away weeks to months after. Um, and so we're also disrupting the ecosystem of homes, and, and, and this conversation is often happening around wanting to protect mothers and babies, and, and frankly, the high maternal mortality and morbidity rates, as well as infant mortality and morbidity rates. What is needed is that people need to know that they can, one, go into healthcare settings and not be criminalized, not have their children taken away, um, and it ends up being a deterrent impact, you know, when someone is concerned about how that's going to impact their entire family unit. And often when women themselves are afraid to go into these healthcare settings, that impacts the children, um, their potential partners, especially if they're men. So this is, I believe, um, not only do I believe, but there are many studies that support that this is yet one more layer of why we are in the medical crisis, especially in certain communities, um, because of this. And I, I love the fact that I'm able to, as a lawyer, sit in this interesting space of being able to litigate and, adv and advocate and do policy work um, with health care providers, with um, prosecutors, with organizers all around, again, centering um, myself and in, in, in the body that I actually I bring in. So are we out of time? Yeah. Okay, we are. unfortunately. <laughs> we have so much more we could talk about, yes. but um, I want to thank these mm -hmm. two wonderful women for coming and joining us today, Erin um, and Sylvia. Yeah. We really appreciate it, and um, thank you for doing such good work on behalf of, of women as well.
Thank you. Okay, so I think we're going to move to our next panel. Is that what we do? Okay. That's what I want. Yeah. Oh, those are the ones that have been successful with. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So, um, so we're going to get started um, on this next panel. Um, so uh, my name is Anju Gupta, and I'm a professor here and director of the Immigrant Rights Clinic. Um, and uh, we just um, launched a, a, a sort of big uh, detention project, which you'll hear about. Um, but I think maybe that was why I was invited to moderate this panel. <laughs> um, but um, I'm going to just start by asking um, our esteemed panelists to um, introduce um, themselves and talk about the work that they're doing. Maybe we'll start down okay. with Sindine. And Hi, everybody. My name is Sindine Pazell. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you for having me here today. I'm with the National Clearinghouse for the Defense of Battered Women. Uh, we're located in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. We're a tiny shop, but we're mighty, I hope. <laughs> uh, we work nationally on cases involving victims, of battering who are criminalized based on their experiences of abuse um, because a lot of times when people are engaged in criminal activity, it's because they are acting to survive. So we work on a lot of self-defense cases, um, duress cases, uh, failure to protect cases when um, parents are charged with harms that their partners inflict upon their children. Um, and that kind of thing. So <clears throat> I went to Temple University, and so I've been in Philadelphia the whole time. Usually when I speak to students, I make a joke about how like I'm a 21L or whatever, but now that I'm over <laughs> 20, I don't think it's quite as funny as I used to think it was. Um, my grounding in this work comes from law school, though, so I wanted to talk about that for a second. I went to law school never having met a lawyer or a judge in my life. Um, but I decided that I was interested in bioethics because it was very thinky. Um, and then I did that thing where I talked to somebody who was a bioethicist and he's like, do you realize I have the only job in the country and you can't have it? Um, I'm like, okay, let me shift. I will shift. Um, and then I got really interested in anti-death penalty work and that path took me to the public defender's office um, where I spent several years before landing here at the National Clearing House. So my grounding has always been in criminal defense issues, but it's nice to work in an organization where I can focus on just one of the pathways to arrest and incarceration, which is battering. And by battering, <clears throat> what I mean is one partner in an intimate relationship using coercive control to dominate the other one. Does that can, you know, a big feature of that is physical abuse, but there's many other ways that one can assert that kind of dominance over your partner. And so many of those ways can launch people right into the criminal legal system. So thanks again for having me here. Hi everyone, I'm Whit Washington. I am the director for the Project for Transgender Incarcerated Survivors at American University Washington College of Law Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Law. Now that I have used my 10 minutes on the title, um, I will get into what I actually do. Um, so I work uh, nationally with transgender and gender nonconforming individuals in prisons and jails who are having issues around safety or access to necessary medical care. Um, we're in about 26 different states. Um, we've we have like over 400 correspondences with people. Um, through my project, I also also run the National Center for Transgender Equality's prison project. Um, so between the two, it's probably close to 500 people that I've personally worked with. Um, I got into this work. I went to American University for law school. Um, I originally went because I was intrigued by the way that it's hard to address discrimination against black women because of the difference between levels of scrutiny for folks who are black and for women. Um, and so like addressing that nexus is super difficult. So I went to law school to address that. I got interested in prisoners' rights uh, through a course called Women, Crime, and the Law. And I realized that when we were talking about women, we were very limited in how we were speaking of women. Specifically, we were speaking almost exclusively about cis women. Um, so I took an internship at Transgender Law Center and really started to focus on uh, the intersection between prisoners' rights and specifically trans prisoners' rights. I'm currently an Equal Justice Works Fellow, so I am only three years um, post-grad uh, law school. And um, I think that's everything that I have to say. 
Um, hi, my name is Lauren Major. I'm the managing attorney at the American Friends Service Committee, which is just right down the road. Um, and the project that I work on is a sort of new detention project. Um, we work in collaboration with Rutgers, Seton Hall, and Legal Services of New Jersey to represent immigrants who are detained here in New Jersey. Um, there are four detention centers, uh, a very large number of detention centers for us fairly small <coughs> state here in New Jersey where thousands of immigrants are detained. Um, two of those detention centers also detain women, Hudson County Jail and the Elizabeth Detention Center. Um, Hudson County is where they detain women who ICE or the Department of Homeland Security considers to be more of a problem um, based on their criminal history. and. The Elizabeth Detention Center is where they detain women who they consider to be, I guess, someone that they're more sympathetic to. So there's a lot of issues um, in the system. Our project is um, sort of modeled to be a public defender style system of representation, sort of modeling that we really think that should be um, the right of every immigrant who's facing potentially permanent exile from their family or being sent to a place where their life is in danger, that they should have an attorney. So we sort of represent everyone um, men, women, people with strong cases, people with very difficult cases, um, who is going before the immigration judge um, facing potential deportation. So that's sort of our project. Um, you know, focusing more specifically on women, a lot of the folks that we represent are asylum seekers who are, who are survivors of gender-based violence. Um, we also represent a lot of LGBTQ individuals who um, face persecution in their countries on that basis. Um, I would say those are two like major groups of people that, that we work with who are then sort of re-traumatized by being detained here in the United States. Thank you all so much um, for describing this obviously uh, amazing and fascinating work that you're all doing. I was wondering if you could talk briefly about how um, the fact that the majority or if not all of your clients are detained and so kind of physically separated from um, from society, how that impacts the work that you're doing. Um, sure, so we work with people who are incarcerated and people who are pre-trial, <clears throat> excuse me, on bail or people who are under some sort of state control, probation, parole, um, whatever. and and. There's a lot to say about that, and one thing is that people who are not under state control are very much more able to navigate and negotiate their own safety, which seems counterintuitive to some people. You know, you know, especially when you know you you watch the Lifetime Channel like I do, and you <laughs> see um, I interviews with people who say, "Wow, jail was the you know safest place." Well, what a sad reality that is when somebody has to say that jail was the safest place I ever lived. But for most survivors, that's just not the case. <clears throat> when they're detained in jails or prisons, not only are they having to negotiate their own safety within that institution, but then their abusive partner uh, knows exactly where they are and might have control around things like um, bail money and release conditions and where somebody can go once they're released and that kind of thing. So people in the free world just have a lot more resources available to them to negotiate their own safety. And what that means for their criminal defense is that they're a lot better able to participate in their own defense. If, um, you know, the safer they are, the more that they can actually work with their attorneys in a, in a, in a more strategic way, which is gonna maximize a more just outcome with that criminal legal case. For me, so I, um, I don't have, we don't really have much money to travel. The fellowship just pays my salary. Um, and so with us, all of our correspondence with the people that we work with is through sa snail mail, um, which mm -hmm. is very time consuming and can be very difficult. I am very lucky that I am a barred attorney and so I can send the mail as legal mail, which means the facility can't open it up. Um, they find interesting ways to get around it. Um, also, setting up legal calls with folks is super hit or miss. Sometimes we have facilities that say, if you're not barred in this jurisdiction, you can't have a legal call. Um, if you're not an official attorney of record, which I often can't be on account of work, I'm working in so many jurisdictions, and I'm only barred in DC, um, that becomes an issue also. And so 
it sort of just highlights the entire issue of when we're talking about people in prison, who's watching over folks, who's maintaining um, order in the space outside of the corrections officers because of a lot of the abuse that we see is either because the corrections officers are ignoring abuses that happen or because they are directly involved in the abuses that are happening. Um, and so that folks are so far away, it makes it really hard to monitor situations and ensure that any progress that has been made hasn't been like double backed on. Yeah, um, I think for us, it really goes to the reason why we decided to focus this project on people who are detained. Um, there are many, many more people who are going through the immigration system not detained. Um, but you know, when someone has at least some ability to work and potentially find an attorney on their own, it's a little bit less dire than when someone is detained, they're unable to work. Um, and they also have a really, really limited ability to gather evidence and prepare their case when they're in detention. Um, you know, immigration cases, mostly depend on gathering like huge amount of documents from someone's home country, from their family, um, and I think that can be really, really difficult to do for someone who's in detention, um, especially someone who either recently arrived in the United States um, and so is trying to gather things from back home, or also you know maybe someone who is coming from an abusive situation or a situation where they were fairly isolated and they don't have a lot of people who are still in their communities that are able to do that work for them. That's when I think a lawyer is particularly step in and, and gather the evidence that they would need to have any chance of success. Thank you. So um, I think especially for, for Sandine and Lauren, since um, you know, you're know you representing clients in their um, their substantive cases, right? That um, and 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 for Cindy, your clients may or may not be detained or or in, uh, incarcerated when you're doing so. Um, but so, how do you balance kind of working on their substantive cases with if they do come to you with um, issues regarding the conditions of their confinement, right? So, if they're being, you know, underfed or, or you know, fed uh, um, food, you know, that is not safe or, um, or being harassed or, you know, any, anything like that. How do you kind of balance th those issues? So, the National Clearinghouse doesn't, like, we don't have direct clients. <clears throat> so, we are more of a legal backup center. We consult with people's attorneys, expert witnesses, and that kind of thing. Um, but being national, what that gives us is a pretty decent network um, of colleagues around the country who are doing anti-violence work. So a lot of the times, people's primary concern when they come to us is not necessarily the prospect of you know a, a being arrested or incarcerated, it's it's getting to the next day. Mm -hmm. um, so we partner as much as we can with um, anti-domestic violence organizations and advocates, whether they're organized or free range, really, and um, try to make sure that there's somebody on the ground in the community where the survivor is coming from um, to help them with, with some of the things you're talking about, um, like food or safety or transportation or, or whatever it is. So we really, you know, we definitely can't do everything, and we know that the, we're not the right people to do everything. And so, you know, making sure that we're net networked in with other people doing this work is is where we can uh, be effective getting some of those, helping to get some of those needs met. Um, yeah, I guess I think that it, a, a lot of times the consequences of someone being detained are so grave that you can't really ignore them and just focus on the, on the legal case. Um, so uh, I think it's just really important to remember as people are setting up programs or, or we're doing this work to um, really push for social workers and other professionals to be a part of your project and also to build really strong connections with other service providers because there are, are so many things that happen that I like am not best suited to address as much as I may want to. Um, I've had numerous clients who suffered physical or sexual abuse by guards in detention, people who had really urgent medical needs that weren't being addressed. Um, sometimes, you know, there's sort of outside issues happening like, you know, I've had numerous clients who were facing the very real possibility of losing custody of their children because they were detained. Um, and those needs are so urgent that, that they really can't be ignored. Um, so that's why I think it's really, really important to, to put in place partnerships with people who are, who have the expertise to address those issues because they really are emergent issues. And so I guess more broadly then, what are um, some of the big changes that you all would love to see in either um, the detention system, 
system or the prison system or the jail system? Oh, God, how much time do we have? <laughs> I don't know, Priscilla. <laughs> um, wow, yeah, that's, that's a big one. First of all, yeah, incarceration should not be the default. Um, and in a lot, not in all communities, I know like New Jersey has done a lot with bail reform stuff. Um, New York City has too, other communities too. Um, but detention should not be the default, and for poor people, it usually is. Um, incarceration, as I said before, should not be seen as a safety option because it's absolutely not. Um, and yeah, in incarceration, we need to find a lot more alternatives. You know, and I want to speak specifically about domestic violence cases here. We I, we just need to remove the notion from our advocacy that anti-domestic violence means pro-prison because it absolutely doesn't and it shouldn't. And in doing that, we need to listen to survivors who tell us what justice looks like for them instead of assuming it looks like an incarcerative sentence for their partners. Because what happens is that we end up with jails and prisons full of survivors, which is what we have now. So I'm gonna stop there or else <laughs> I won't stop <laughs> and pass. Um, I'm going to be bold and say it, get rid of prisons. Um, a lot of the people that I work with, regardless of the type of crime that they've committed, a lot of it has to do with the survival economy. Um, specifically with trans folks, they are discriminated against to a point where they are often pushed into the margins of society. And for folks who are not allowed to stay at their home, for folks who are not allowed to stay in school, um, for folks who are having trouble accessing medical care because they're too afraid to have to talk to their doctor, people who can't access public benefits, um, that long list of things that trans folks are often excluded from, folks who experience that end up in a survival economy. So that's folks who are selling drugs, trading sex, any sort of um, illicit uh, acts, um, they end up in the criminal criminal legal system and, and eventually end up in prison. Um, so I think that the big change is a refocus on social services um, to folks in different communities and building people up and, like you said, not using prison as the social safety net that we have in our society. Um, yes, I agree. I don't think there's any reason for immigration detention to exist. The alleged reason for it to exist is for, to ensure that people come to court, and there are clearly many ways to do that that don't involve incarcerating them. Um, short of that, I think there are obviously a lot of reforms needed. Um, you know, one example is I think, you know, here in New Jersey we've seen bail reform, so many people are getting out um, of criminal custody, but then they get immediately flipped to ICE custody with their criminal case still pending, and then they're detained by immigration and unable to resolve the criminal case, which they need to do to resolve their immigration case, and there's no such bail reform in, in immigration detention, so those people who are let out on their own recognizance um, from criminal detention are denied bond or set you know, a $40,000 bond or something like that in immigration detention, so we like desperately need reform in that area to move away from, from detention being the default. Um, and also I think there's a lot of work to be done in bringing accountability to jails and detention centers. You know, we operate in a system where they are incentivized to provide the barest minimum of care to make as much money as possible because it's a for-profit operation. So medical care and food and other services are, are extremely deficient um, and there's really, really limited oversight um, when it comes to abuse and, and medical neglect and things like that. So um, can you, uh, uh, the, all three of you, talk about um, the ways in which gender in particular might, um, might impact someone's experience um, in detention or in, in prison, um, you know, either for women or for trans folks or gender nonconforming um, folks, if uh, just how those, those things um, might impact their experience in particular? Um, yeah, I think there are there are several ways. One thing that comes to mind is obviously when you're talking about people who may fear harm because of their um, gender identity or sexual orientation, being detained with other people who are from that same culture um, that did not accept you because of those factors is obviously very scary, and particularly with 
transgender clients, we've seen a lot of problems with the way that jails have decided to deal with them. We had a client last week who is a transgender woman who um, we just submitted an asylum form, which is supposed to be confidential to court, and they alerted the jail that, that she identifies as a transgender woman, and they moved her without her permission to solitary confinement, right? So they both like outed her, and now she's in <coughs> solitary confinement where she doesn't feel safe. Um, so, you know, I think there, there's a lot of work to do around those kind of issues. Um, and I think for women in general, because um, the detention centers are majority men, there are much less services um, and there are access issues for women, for example, like um, the Elizabeth Detention Center used to be only men and now with a greater number of women being detained, they also have women there, but women only can have visitors for, I think, half an hour twice a week, whereas the men can get visitors for several hours every day. Mm. Um, so they just like haven't adjusted to meet the needs of women. Or there's also um, the majority of classes for people are at the Essex County Correctional Facility, but women aren't held there. They're held at another detention center where there are no GD classes, other classes um, that, that they can have access to. So there's a lot of um, differences for women who are detained in terms of like access to services. Yeah, so speaking sort of generally about the prison system, that's sort of a, a general sort of blanket statement of in women's prisons specifically, there aren't just aren't as many programs. Um, they're often much more geared towards home ec and those sort of traditional um, views and understandings of what women should aspire to know and understand and be. Whereas with the men's facilities, there are often um, like, it's like mechanic class or those sort of practical hard skills so that once they are out of prison, they do have a set of skills that they can bring to the formal economy. With specifically with trans folks, um, it's prison's a very dangerous space. I will admit and must say before I continue speaking that when I'm talking about trans folks in prison, I'm primarily speaking about trans women in prisons. Um, just through my project, I haven't really heard much from trans men in prison, so I can sort of only stipulate to the things that they're experiencing. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to put that out there. But with trans women specifically, they are held at men's facilities. I think there's something like almost 4,000 or 5,000 trans folks in prison uh, in the US right now, and there are only 15 confirmed cases of trans women being housed in women's facilities. Mm. Um, and so issues of sexual assault for trans folks, they're eight times more likely to be sexually assaulted by a prison guard than the general population, and 12 times more likely to be sexually assaulted by another person in custody um, than the general population. So it's just a very dangerous place for trans women in custody. Um, we also see issues as in general society around just general discrimination and harassment, which you can't, there's actually no action on. If it's just words of harassment, you can't file a claim in court. Um, and we also see issues around access to, so if they are in a male facility and they do have these programs, they're actually often not allowed to have access to those programs, um, sometimes for safety reasons and sometimes generally just for transphobia. So also because of these safety reasons, despite facilities, they're not really supposed to do this, but like you said, using solitary confinement as a means of keeping people safe. Um, while there are regulations that state that people should only be held in solitary confinement, or as they call it, administrative segregation, but it's the same thing, um, for 30 days. And then after that, they're gonna need to have like a proper reason of why they're keeping them there. Um, because they're supposed to be looking at the safest option of where to keep people. They often just sort of leave people in there and come up with whatever issue. Again, going back to the problem mm -hmm. of there's no oversight to really enforce these rules and regulations um, that prison should be following. Um, for trans men, so the few trans men that I have heard from, we're seeing a lot of issues around um, denying access to testosterone because they're mm -hmm. acting too aggressive according to the guards. So we've seen specifically in Pennsylvania, this has been a means of controlling trans men and their access to gender affirming um, medical treatment, which is sort of a general issue across the board in addition to sexual assault and violence of just generally access to medical treatment. Um, while gender dysphoria, which is the distress that someone experiences between 
the sex they were assigned at birth and their gender identity, which is how they understand their gender um, and how they sometimes they choose to express their gender because sometimes people are forced into the closet. Um, when individuals are dealing with gender dysphoria, there are certain ways that you're supposed to treat it. The World Professional Association of Transgender Health, uh, WPATH, has listed uh, standards of care and how you're supposed to treat gender dysphoria. Um, but we often see facilities not either just sort of generally they're having issues getting access to a medical assessment um, or the doctor is not qualified or just generally transphobic. Uh, the facility won't give folks access to outside assistance um, and diagnoses or they're just sort of denying them any sort of medical care. And I would say that those are safety classification, whether they're in a male or female facility, um, and access to medical care are, and solitary confinement also linked to safety, are the main ways that folks' gender impacts their experience and how they're treated in prisons. Um, I think my colleagues have, have covered a, a lot of the ways that gender can impact what incarceration and detention look like for people. And I will say, I mean, it sucks regardless of your gender, so I just want to put that out there. Um, but one thing that I see continually <clears throat> in the work I do, the majority of cases that I work on involve defendants who are parents. And um, when women are incarcerated, they're, you know, they're expected to continue to parent, and they're also not allowed to parent all at the same time. So you see things, um, like Lauren mentioned, with visiting hours being extremely limited. You know, when are the women's facilities visiting hours? Well, they're when the kids are supposed to be at school. Okay, so, so you're, you know, if you're launched into the child protective system, you're either not visiting your kid or you're not letting them go to school. So pick one. It's a big catch-22. It's a setup, and what it results in is that, um, you know, a lot of parents lose access to their children based only on incarceration, <coughs> despite the fact that there's directive after directive after directive about maintaining that parent-child bond. Access to health care, which we've all um, talked about, is of course another big one, and it, it, it warrants highlighting reproductive health care, um, because women who are, are pregnant when they're incarcerated or detained and are going to end up having that child while they're incarcerated or detained may or not have a choice about whether or not they want to have that child. And if they do have that child, are not going to be afforded the humane and dignified and safety setup that that non-incarcerated woman would be. I mean, we, we hear about across the country, there's lots of communities where they're still shackling pregnant women, um, expecting folks to give birth while they are physically restrained, which we have known for a long time is not safe for anybody. Um, and we've also known for a long time that people in the midst of giving birth are not exactly a flight risk. Um, <laughs> but the, <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, but, but these are still ways that people's um, gender is dictating the way that their health care needs are being served. So yeah, that's fun. That's, that's all. Thank you. And I guess conversely, can you talk about maybe how your own gender or perceived gender um, or gender identity or um, race, you know, it, basically your own identities um, or perceived identities have, have or could impact the work that you're doing in these facilities? Um, in, the, in the facilities, I'm, I'm not, yeah. S since I haven't done the um, um, stuff inside for a long period of time, I'll talk about um, my work kind of on the outside, you know, as a white, cis, queer gal. When I call, you know, I work with a lot of criminal defense attorneys. Um, and there's some stereotypes we can go into about what that might look like uh, there. But a lot of times, you know, I, I have to work pretty hard to convince the lawyers that I'm working with that I'm not, you know, like one of those DV girls who is, you know, calling because she wants to give his client a hug, you know. Um, so that that's a barrier too. It's like, you know, 
um, there's just this dichotomy that gets set up, you know, be, sort of because of the way that we've tackled domestic violence and, and, and sort of just because of the way that gender stereotypes play out, but that um, being anti-domestic violence and being pro-criminal defense are seen as feminine and masculine and never the two shall meet. So, so that can be complicated, so then I have to, you know, I don't swear a little bit and tell a war story and talk about, you know, my days in the courtroom and then, you know, I can maybe get to a point where we can have this criminal defense conversation. Um, and it sucks because, you know, I'm, I'm not one of the guys. I don't want to be one of the guys, but that's how I'm going to get my job done, you know, and sometimes mm -hmm. that's the, the, the route that I have to go. So that's, you know, that's definitely a part of my job, you know, helping people, um, litigate their cases by convincing them that they thought of whatever it is that I just said, if that happens. Um, yeah, so it's, you know, that's a complication, but not necessarily from the um, point of view of somebody working with incarcerated folks. Um, so I don't know if you know this, I am a black, queer, gender non-conforming person, if you couldn't tell by looking at me. Um, and so that does sometimes pose an issue, I talk with my supervisor a lot. I um, offer technical assistance to uh, prisons and jails around the country. Um, more specifically, I've worked in Maryland. I live in DC, so it was just a quick drive. Um, and I speak with my supervisor about being very intentional about how I'm dressing, um, about the language that I use, um, not using folks as much, which is sort of a term of art I feel in the queer community so that you're not being gendered. Um, I like to wear colors and have a little more fun with the things I wear. I tend to wear a black suit. Um, the whole point of which is that me going into a space, people are already confused by me. And so people are going to spend more time trying to figure out what's going on with me um, than actually listening to what I have to say. So really trying to present as conservative as I can without ignoring my identity and not being true and authentic to who I am. Um, and so that's an issue. Another issue that I find is that I'm speaking with corrections folks. I am a 31-year-old new lawyer um, who's never worked in corrections and law enforcement folks and corrections folks are like, you don't even know what you're talking about. Why would I listen to you? You sound like a hippie. I don't understand. Um, and so it, there's a lot of negotiating um, and work that I have to put in just to be sort of seen and, and heard in any sort of way. Uh, yeah, I think that gender, I've seen it play a large role both in developing trust and relationships with clients and in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, probably for, for all of us, you're often asking a client to share really traumatic and personal information really quickly and um, sort of developing trust with them. I think, you know, gender can play a big role. You know, some people will have a, a much harder time. We've seen, you know, them react very differently to someone who might have the same gender as the person who um, sexually assaulted them or versus someone with their own gender or, you know, I think it can play a big role in how comfortable someone can be because it's not a comfortable situation to share that sort of information that you may not have shared before in a jail setting that's not very private to someone you just met. Um, so I think it's just like something that's really important to be aware of and to train people to think about and maybe to have different people talk to the same person um, and, and really be like aware of the role that that might play. Thank you. So I know I'm just the moderator, but I wanted to also jump in here and like kind of answer the question that I asked, um, because you know I see that there are, are a lot of you know women in the audience and and um, a lot of brown women, and um, I think it's really important to be aware of how we are often perceived um, in like a courtroom situation. You know, I practice um, immigration law. I uh, run a clinic where I take students with me to court. Um, and I just want to give an anecdote of something that happened to me a, a few years ago when I was practicing. Uh, I was uh, at a hearing with a student, um, and uh, we were in immigration court, and it was a master calendar hearing, so it was like basically, you know, they have like 50 people that they're going to, you know, go through their cases very quickly and, and schedule them for their actual hearings. Um, but the courtroom was so crowded that the uh, court clerk asked uh, all of the pro se individuals to wait outside in the hallway and they would take the, um, 
the, the cases where people were represented first, and that's its own issue, but um, I won't get into that right now. Um, so, you know, we were left with a courtroom full of um, uh, people who were represented and their lawyers. And um, so then she comes out to, to, the, to the gallery to do some, uh, you know, crowd management or whatever, and she comes up to me and she's like, who are you here with, honey? And like, and I was like, what? And she, and she was like, who are you here with? And then she, and I think I was just kind of stunned. And then she, um, she turns to the the young white male student sitting next to me, who's like more than t ten years younger than me at this point. And she said, is he, is she here with you? And he was like, uh, yeah. And she was like, okay. And then left. And it took us a while to like realize what had just happened. But I, you know, she assumed that I was the immigrant that he was representing. And then I think because I didn't answer right away, she assumed that I didn't speak English and then, you know, asked him and, 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 and you know, it was fine. And I, and I was wearing a suit. I was holding a Redwell, which is like the universal symbol of like being a, a lawyer. Like there were like a lot of things that she had to look past to kind of, um, you know, stereotype in this way. And, um, and I, I think it's just, you know, I think it's something to be aware of, right, that uh, the, per, the perception um, that just, you know, by walking into a room um, that, that folks might have um, of you as attorneys. So, um, so Priscilla, that 15-minute warning, does that include time for Q&A from the audience? Okay. So um, why don't we do that? Because I want to, okay. So let's open it up to questions. We're, we're live streaming, so we want to make sure people are in, uh, <laughs> we're in Camden. Got it. Hello, folks in Camden. <laughs> um, my name is Tamara. I'm a future law student, and so, and actually today is my birthday, which I just wanted everyone to know that. Happy uh, I'm not one of those folks who's shy about celebrating my birthday. So, <laughs> um, and I thought this was a great conference to to start my day off with. Obviously, so um, I asked. I was seated next to Wit early on the panel, so I asked with this, con this question and um, was, was answered. So I'll put it out to the other panelists, but we'd feel free to jump in if you wanna share with the, with the rest of the group. In light of the very important and pretty heavy work that you all do, can you share with us what you do for self-care um, and how you set boundaries around, around your work and, and life? Thank you. Um. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think there's a, a couple things I'll say about that. One is that in my office of really brilliant and forward thinking and professional people, we have the most disgusting senses of humor um, that I've ever heard, and 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 it's it's gross, but it's such a coping mechanism. And it's, I'm always amazed when something comes out of my mouth and I'm like, oh, I just said that. <laughs> and I, you know, I look around. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, so, so there is a way to sort of infuse humor, albeit dark humor, into our work that can like lessen the load sometimes. It took me a long time um, to figure out how to leave my work at the office, which we just kind of can't do, really. Um, but, but to a certain extent, you can, you know, when, when you walk out the door and you walk down the stairs and then you, live, uh, th then you live your life. I had to learn some strategies how to do that when um, we were working, uh, v just doing very minor um, work on the fringes with, with a woman who, uh, was she pled guilty and was sentenced to the death penalty on a case where her abusive partner ended up killing her um, abusive husband, ex-husband, excuse me, um, and the state she was in did end up executing her. And uh, after that, I started to have panic attacks, and because I... You know, I, I'm, I'm good at some things, I'm not good at everything like self-reflection. I didn't tie the two together, mm -hmm. okay? So I went to um, therapy and I learned some techniques about breathing and there are things that I do every single day now. Um, I've learned that spending a lot of time with my friends helps. I've learned that going outside helps. 
Um, I'm not very good at taking my own advice all of the time. Um, playing in the dirt helps me a lot. And going to happy hour, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's really hard. Um, I think something that's helped me a lot is I think that um, when you're dealing with making like legal and strategy decisions that could be life or death that like feel so heavy, it's helped a lot to really develop like close relationships with colleagues who you trust to talk all of those things through with and sort of like help you carry that load and not feel like the sole responsibility for those decisions is on your head and and sort of having that and like fostering those relationships has really helped me be able to when I leave like not continue to obsess about those decisions not always but most <laughs> of the time um, you know and and you know as we all do like really trying to separate if it's not an emergency like I have a nice long commute to Brooklyn from here so like using that time to sort of switch gears um, on like an average day when it's not an emergency is good. And I think sort of feeling like you're working in solidarity and sharing the load with other people that you trust like really helps like let go of some of that weight. Um, and so I agree a lot with both of these folks, therapy, dark humor, um, <laughs> and I'm very intentional of, I work from like maybe eight to six and outside of those hours I'm not working on the weekends, I'm not working. I'm not stressing myself out about work, which is very hard to do. Um, and then also, I actually don't consume any sort of media that has anything to do with prison. Um, and there are also sort of some power dynamics in media and shows that are a bit triggering for me, so I stay away from those also. Um, really trying to keep my entertainment and personal life separate from the work that I do. So for therapy, for me, working with kids for the last 50 years, I volunteer to work with incarcerated women, and that helps me dealing with kids' parents. <laughs> <clears throat> I do it here in New Jersey and in Hunterdon County, and it seems in the last five years or so, it has gotten more hopeless and markedly different in the women's prison in this state than the two other facilities in my county for men. And it's been remarked upon at several levels by the volunteers who work at that prison. Do you have any comments on that or insight? Um, just sort of speaking generally about women's prisons, we have to look at the history of women's prisons to understand why we're having so many issues and there's such a vast difference between men's facilities and women's facilities. So originally women's facilities were, they were men's facilities and they just kind of threw women in there. Um, and women in women's facilities were often in there for uh, veering away from the moral code and what women are supposed to do. Um, so for engaging in sex work, for being independent, um, any, of the, any of those sort of things. Um, so you see a lot of women going into these facilities, but then you're seeing they eventually, in like the 1900s, 1920s, something like that, um, there was this whole movement of we have to save these women. So they actually did start to separate women out into their own facilities. But still, because it was trying to put women back on this path of proper womanhood, they still did only focus on um, things that like make women proper women. Um, so then you also have to look at more recently is just the increase in the number of women. I think, I don't know specifically the dates or the numbers, um, but sometime I think in the past 10 years or so, or maybe in the 90s, the number of women incarcerated went up by like 300%. So we're seeing an influx in facilities that weren't created with women in mind, um, and so you're having that issue of facilities don't actually know how to work with women. So you see issues around access to menstrual product, products. Um, and like you said, shackling women to, to beds because women were not considered when creating these systems. And so as women are increasingly more incarcerated, we're starting to see those cracks appear and be greater.
Hello. Um, I am a student here, and I'm writing, I'm actually on the Women's Rights Law Reporter, and I'm writing my note on aging women in prisons. And so I was wondering if any of you had personal experience or any, because, you know, I do tons, of, like, been doing a lot of research, so I kind of want to hear about people's, um, like, real life experience, because, like, I, all these, what you, what you just said about mass incarceration, that has increased the amount of people, and then more importantly, like, when in the 70s and 80s, people who had life sentences, now they're, you know, they're like 80 now, so it's just, do you have any like personal like stuff about that? Uh, has anybody here uh, seen the documentary Sin by Silence? Okay, it's a documentary about a group of women in California prisons um, called um, Incarcerated Women Against Abuse. And the reason that I'm bringing them up now is because they still exist and they're, for the most part, lifers. And a lot of them have been in 30 plus years. And I did get the opportunity to go inside um, and sit in on one of their meetings. And it was just, it, it's something I'll never forget, the, the way that these lifers, and that's how they identify themselves, these lifers were mothers and mentors and teachers and leaders, you know, for the younger folks who would come in um, and join the group. Some people were still engaged in legal battles and some people were not. And so it, it, it was interesting to watch this joy grief process, right, when somebody who had done an extraordinarily long prison sentence, we're talking, you know, over 20 years, um, gets released to the community, um, the, 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 the place where they were the elder and they were taking care of their family. There's, you know, joy that they're being released and sorrow that they're not gonna be that parent figure anymore. And this isn't me celebrating incarceration, this is me, you know, celebrating the value um, that older people have in mentoring younger people, whether on the inside or the outside. Some people would get released for legal reasons. Other people would be compassionately released. And compassionately released very rarely means that. Um, it usually means that they have a health care problem that the state doesn't want to pay for. Um, and so they get something like clemency or early parole or something, and they are um, released just basically to die of things that they probably wouldn't have had if they weren't incarcerated. So I think. Um, I'm totally on two different tangents here, but 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 I think that that healthcare for um, older prisoners is probably what I see. You know what I've heard from them as as one of their um, biggest and most present concerns. The uh, it's like the you know we're concerned about reproductive just like reproductive about having you know pads and tampons but we forget about older women who are going through menopause who don't, you know, like, what to do with that or are confined to, like, walkers and prisons are not, you know, really don't abide by, like, the ADA. So it's it's just, it's very interesting. Yeah, and all those things that people on the outside deal with as they age, but the acceleration of those things that happens because of the trauma and unhealthy conditions of incarceration. That was our last question. Is it? Okay. I just want to thank our panelists for this um, really um, interesting um, discussion. Thank you for being here. And thank you for everyone who's joined us for the first two panels. Now we will break uh, for lunch, and there's bag lunch outside. Uh, they're all labeled uh, the vegetarian options, chicken options different kinds of options. So feel free to join us for lunch. Thank you so much. Of course, thank you for having us. Thank you. Nice to see you face to face. Too. Sorry, I was emailing you. I was like emailing for a month now. Oh, that's exactly. so funny. Oh, thank you. Yeah. This was great. Yeah. 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 And I'm going to eat lunch and then we're going to head back. Hi. It's my partner's birthday. Oh. Got it, yeah. 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 Ye
<laughs> going at you. I got you back lunch. <laughs> Happy Plus, birthday. Chips and apples. People, it's like it's like prom, so you angle center. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I do all my, and I will just always start with the caveat that I am a writer. So, <laughs> and I can make these um, available to the editors and share with their group. Yeah. All right, looking my way. Done. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll make sure, cause you know.
And you have to like not get my feet. You are awesome. Really
Hello. 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 Hi guys. So we're just gonna get started in five minutes. Yeah. One thirty-five. Oh shit. <laughs> I'm I'm never going to be able to get this back. I was on the Berkeley Women's Law Journal, which is no longer called that. You were on the what? The Berkeley, Berkeley Women's Law Journal. Oh, Berkeley Women's Law Journal. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's now called like the Berkeley Journal of Gender and something or other. <laughs> <laughs> Sand is so nice, I'm not going to be able to get it home. Um, I was at the ABA. Oh, oh. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Wrong mic. Hot mic. Never mind. Never mind. Right. <laughs> Never mind. We'll chit chat later. Thank you. <laughs> so they don't turn off. The ABA was having a terrible rain for the whole conference. Oh, is that what it's for? It's the weather there. To Newark. Yeah. Well, no, I went to JFK, but it was like five in the morning. Oh, oh my God, I must be exhausted. Yeah. 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 I'll, I'll call you. Yeah. Yeah. I got to see another night. I was just going to say that. Yeah. Lucky you. I was just going to say that. It's interesting, right? Yeah, it's funny. Yeah. This is on now. Hello? Hi everyone, I hope you all had a chance to grab lunch and I hope you enjoyed lunch. We're now going to get started with the afternoon session of our panels, which is the economic justice panel. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm gonna be moderating the panel today. My name is Emily Klein and I'm an assistant clinical professor here at Rutgers. Um, for those of, of you just joining us today, this is, um, the 50th anniversary of the Women's Rights Law Reporter. And um, we are celebrating that today with a special symposium. And this panel is the Economic Justice Panel. Um, and we're gonna be focusing on topics of, of economic justice, in particular how current federal and state labor law and employment legislation impacts women in the workplace. Um, and I'd like to begin by introducing our panel members. Uh, we have with us today um, Deborah Vegans, President and CEO of the National Network to End Domestic Violence, and Nicole Berner, who's the General Counsel of the Service Employees International Union. So I'm going to give Deborah and Nicole each um, a few minutes or some time to talk about their backgrounds and um, sort of their interests and what they focus on um, um, in this area. And then we will have a question and answer period. And then at the end, we'll reserve 10, 15 minutes, hopefully, for uh, Q&A from the audience. Okay. 
So um, if you guys could just get started. Deborah, do you want to start sure. and give us your background? Sure. Um, I'm so excited to be here. Hello to everyone here. Hello to the folks here in Camden. Um, I'm, um, uh, as you heard, I'm the CEO of the National Network to End Domestic Violence. I've been in that job a total of three months. Um, I'm so new that I was actually invited when I was in a prior job. Um, because in my prior job, I was the senior vice president of public policy and research at the American Association of uh, uh, America. <laughs> I'm already messing up the. Excuse me, <laughs> at the um, American Association of University Women. And while there, I focused on um, economic justice. I ran uh, what was called the Paycheck Fairness Act Coalition, which was a coalition of 200 groups fighting for um, pay equity laws. Um, before that, I was um, at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission where um, uh, I got to work on some groundbreaking issues on pay data collection, uh, on um, uh, working on an ex different executive orders that I had helped pass in the, or get through in my job before that, which was with the ACLU. And when I was at the ACLU, I was working, uh, I was the lead lobbyist on the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act and trying to uh, work with the friendly administration that was doing lots of interesting things on, on pay equity. And, um, and then before that, I was litigating class actions at um, Cohen Milstein, um, big national um, uh, gender and race pay and promotion class action. So it's been the um, motivating force of my life is women's economic uh, empowerment and equality. Um, and so I'm just very, very excited to, to be here. Um, I wanted to tell one, just one quick story, which is when I was invited to come speak, I don't think that the, the, um, the Priscilla and the wonderful people who called me realized that I had published in this journal 25 years ago, which was actually my start, one of my starts. And um, what was interesting is, the, so it was 1993, and um, I started writing an article about the 1991 Civil Rights Act. It was a new act that you know, was tried to fix some bad Supreme Court cases. And in it, um, I posited that um, designing a workplace, now this isn't going to sound that novel or controversial, but at that time, I wrote that des workplaces that were designed around a male worker norm, insane hours, with the presumption, you know, long continuous hours with the presumption that someone else was at home taking care of household things or children um, would, be a, would have a disparate impact on women workers and therefore a violation of Title VII. And the, man, the remedy, I said, was that all workplaces should be required to have on-site child care facilities. And um, I tried to publish it with my law review at my law school, and they told me it was too controversial and they would not publish it. They did not tell me that it was bad or that it didn't qualify. They said, we're not going to do it. And by the way, maybe it should be at our newly created gender journal. So it was <laughs> insulting all around the way they, they framed it. So old school before the internet, I put it in a manila envelope, and I sent it up here. And um, you all published me. So thank you very much. <laughs> See if I can make this work. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I appreciate your story. I also was on the Women's Law Journal at my law school, um, and we actually had a mandate on the Berkeley Women's Law Journal that I think it still exists today that we would not publish an article about women's rights unless it had an intersectional lens. So it, the articles had to sort of look at gender justice in the context of racial justice or um, disability rights or immigrant justice or a number of other um, justice lenses. And um, that's really been the focus of my work since uh, actually even before going to law school and really um, why I wanted to go to law school was to work on women's rights and the intersections of other justice fights. And really that's why I came to the Service Employees International Union because we are a union that is um, a majority women, a majority people of color. Um, the, most of the service workers, we represent two million workers in the United States, Puerto Rico, and Canada, and all of the members of our union work in the service and care industries. So that's about half of our uh, membership is in healthcare. So as you can imagine, um, those workers are at the crosshairs, both in politics today because of the attacks on healthcare 
um, in this country and also today, literally uh, as we speak because of the uh, coronavirus and our members are um, at the front lines of that um, crisis as well. Um, and then um, in addition, our union represents property services workers, so janitors, security guards. I don't know if the cleaning crew at this university are SEIU members, but they may well be. Um, we do represent um, lots of workers up and down the East Coast who um, clean buildings and security guards in buildings as well. And then um, the, um, the final group of uh, the se sector that we represent are public services workers. So that's um, healthcare workers in public hospitals, um, workers in public schools who are not teachers are our members. Um, and that's, uh, that's the third sector of the, of the union. And um, before I was at SEIU, I actually was a litigator as well. I worked for Planned Parenthood Federation of America and I was litigating reproductive rights cases. And I saw um, every day the attacks on women and on healthcare and um, really came to believe that without collective action, we could not have really true systemic change in our country. And uh, I saw the work that SEIU was doing um, in the area at the time of trying to get healthcare reform passed and trying to protect Medicaid uh, and healthcare for low-income folks. Um, and I decided to come join SEIU about 15 years ago. And actually, uh, two days after the inauguration of our current occupant of the White House, I became general counsel of SEIU. So I've been kind of on a wild ride <laughs> ever since the inauguration. Um, so I don't know, I think most, um, I have three um, kids who are um, in early 20s and a teenager, and um, I would venture to guess that uh, you all, like most of their um, friends and classmates, don't know a lot about unions or what unions do, because unfortunately um, the labor movement is quite um, uh, diminished from what it was at its peak um, about 50 years ago. So. Um, I will answer, I will talk about labor law and labor law reform, but I just wanted to open by saying that um, uh, long before the Me Too movement gave rise to a voice for women um, to talk about sexual harassment at work, collective bargaining gave women workers tools to fight in their workplaces, both dis discri against discrimination on the base of gender, but also other types of workplace um, issues they were able to raise collectively through their unions. and. Um, whether it's negotiating for things like uh, childcare at work or parental leave or domestic partner policies, um, all of those types of policies um, that have been enacted into law really began um, with collective bargaining by unions bringing those issues to the table at their workplaces and at their work sites and then later um, pushing for laws to protect workers and women workers more broadly um, so that they were expanding their protections that they had through collective bargaining to the rest of uh, women in the workforce. Um, and so it's been a, the labor movement has really been at the forefront of social change around um, work equity and economic justice issues. And um, even uh, with all of the attacks on the labor movement, and I would say those attacks are because um, of the success in not only in the workplace, but also um, in the political uh, realm that unions have had that there has been such an attack. But I think I'm gonna have a chance to talk about that uh, as well. Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you. So, so I'll start by asking both of you um, just to speak on what you see as the major impediment to economic justice for women in the workplace today. Should I start? Go ahead, sure. Um, before I start, I was gonna say one of the favorite, my favorite bumper stickers I've ever seen is one that said, The Weekend brought to you by the labor movement. Yeah. And, and, and I just have to, my, that's like from like 60 years ago. I know, but I love so it. what I say is we need to have a bumper sticker that says trans inclusive health care brought to you by that's the labor movement yeah. because that also was brought by the labor movement. So, you know, we need to bring this into the 21st century. Yeah. Okay, I'm dating myself. Um, um, so, wait, well, it is the 50th anniversary, so we can be, um, yeah, old. Um, so, so the, the biggest, the biggest impediment to economic justice, unfortunately I don't think there's one, and this is such a lawyer's answer, I'm not answering it, I'm not giving you one answer, it's, That's it's intersectional, <laughs> it's, it's um, a lot of things. I think, you know, if, if I was going to sort of sum it up, I'd say that it's be, that we continue to be underpaid, undervalued, and underestimated, so. That's, that's sort of the big picture. Um, 
Um, I, and I think, you know, I think um, Nicole will touch on a lot of this, but um, women and particularly uh, women of color are overrepresented in low wage jobs in every sector. And certainly the work that I've seen is that, I, you know, I submit that the low wage jobs are low because women are in them. Um, and, you know, I, I also, um, you know, I, I, I've looked at a lot of um, uh, different occupations and pay because occupational segregation is a huge problem and we'll also talk about that. But we pay men more in America for watching cars than we pay women for watching children. So parking lot attendants generally make more than um, childcare workers. Um, so, you know, that's sort of that sums it up. But, um, uh, so, but the, the, the ongoing battle for women's economic security um, includes, you know, pay discrimination, um, got se and all these things intersect, sexual harassment, occupational segregation, gendered societal expectations, um, and all of these things limit our full participation in the, in the workplace and then limit our independence and equality. Um, and again, it all sort of comes back down to the fact that we have expectations that women's income, that women are not primary um, uh, sole breadwinners, uh, that there's uh, primary caretakers that are women that are at home, and all of this um, lowers women's earning potential. Um, and all of this will require, there's not one single solution, right? So there's major labor and employment reforms that are needed and cultural change. And so um, in, my, in my last job, I started talking about sort of a three-legged stool. So it's gotta be, it's gotta be legal change, it's gotta be employer change, um, and uh, cultural and individual change all together. So easy, right? <laughs> So um, I, I'll speak from the perspective of the low-wage women workers that we represent um, at SEIU. So about a quarter of our members are home care workers, but we represent 500,000 home care workers uh, in the United States. And home care, in case you didn't know, is the fastest growing job in America, but it's also one of the lowest paid. Um, most of the people who do home care are women um, of color, many immigrants, many undocumented. Um, we also represent childcare workers, and as I mentioned, janitors, security guards, and other service and care workers. And for these workers, really the major, I would say, again, I agree with the Deborah, there are many impediments, but um, the major impediment are the structural barriers that exist in our laws to collective action. Um, for low wage workers, um, these, the, the power inequities between the employer and the workers are really insurmountable unless they can join together collectively. If you think about the way, I don't know, how many people have taken um, employment law? A few of you. So you know that um, uh, in most cases, because of um, the way our laws are structured, um, uh, an employee has to get a, a lawyer to bring a case against their employer. And for low wage workers, it's very difficult to get an attorney because the damages are very low in cases of low wage workers. And um, so oftentimes, a low wage worker who is experiencing discrimination at work, whether it's pay discrimination or sexual harassment um, on the job or another form of discrimination, um, finds it very difficult to get an attorney. Um, but a unionized worker um, is able to bring a claim through the collective bargaining process, through the grievance process under the collective bargaining agreement, um, and is able to um, file a complaint, go through the grievance process, and so not only is the collective bargaining process where the wages are negotiated as a group with the union against the employer, um, where there are uh, instances of discrimination, employees are able to vindicate their rights without having to hire a private attorney. Um, but the labor laws in this country are fundamentally broken. Um, they were uh, written about 85 years ago when our economy was totally different than it is today. They were written for workers who mostly worked in large industrial work settings. Think about uh, steel mills or um, auto manufacturing plants where mostly um, white men worked and um, job classifications that were majority female, majority immigrant, and majority people of color were systematically written out of the law at that time and really it was to answer, um, it was a compromise um, in Congress when the National Labor Relations Act was passed 
um, as a way to appease the concerns of white supremacists in Congress at the time who didn't want the laws to cover agricultural workers or domestic workers, so home care workers, agricultural workers, um, other workers in sectors that are primarily women and people of color were not written into the US labor law. Um, and then since that time, 85 years ago, it's actually gotten worse, not better. There are fewer workers in unions now than there were then. Um, and, um, and not only have there been structural changes in our economy, like what um, Professor David Wheel, who's at um, uh, Brandeis, calls the fissurization of the workforce. So you think about how work is now contracted out work instead of everybody in a big factory working for the same employer. There's lots of different employers in the same workplace. So now, so many workers work for small employers um, that are either franchise, uh, franchise workplaces like a McDonald's, for example, um, or um, are considered independent contractors like Uber and Lyft drivers. Those workers are not covered by our labor laws at all. So only 46% of the American workforce is even allowed to form a union. And then when workers try to form a union, um, uh, they're met with um, anti-union campaigns that um, are essentially allowed to run unfettered because of the way our labor law is structured. So um, employers wage anti-union campaigns. They refuse to bargain once the workers do form a union. And, um, and oftentimes those with the power to make, to set wages and make decisions are not even at the bargaining table. So I'll, I'll talk a lot about McDonald's because um, we're in the midst of a big campaign to um, hold McDonald's accountable, um, but uh, the workers at McDonald's stores, um, even when they get to the bargaining table, are not bargaining with the corporate parent. They're not bargaining with McDonald's, they're bargaining with a, one single franchise owner who doesn't himself or herself have the power to even change um, the terms and conditions of employment at the work site. So um, I would say uh, the inability to join collectively is a huge impediment to economic uh, uh, equality for women. Um, and then I also, um, at SEIU, we talk a lot about the connections between structural racism and economic justice, and we believe that without ending structural racism and anti-black racism in this country, we cannot achieve ec economic justice for anyone. Um, and so, although this is uh, specifically focused on women, this uh, forum, I actually um, believe that we need to tackle um, racial, racial inequities and structural racism in our country if we're gonna achieve economic justice for um, women and families as well. Thank you. Um, Deborah. maybe you can expand a little bit on um, how the culture of structural racism and structural sexism in this country has contributed to pay inequities for women um, and if there are any other contributors to the pay gap that you see um, existing out there. So in my last job at the American Association of University Women, we put out a report every year called The Simple Truth About the Gender Wage Gap, and it would um, set out, you know, you, a lot of you have heard the wage gap numbers, the 82 cents on the dollar, which is just, a, as, you know, that's not controlling for factors, that's just across the board, all men, all women. And then if you, if you uh, look at um, African American women compared to white men, it's in the 60s. And if you look at uh, Latinas compared to white men, it's in the 50s, 50 cents on the dollar that white men would earn. Um, and so we, um, and then we, uh, I shouldn't say we anymore, at AUW, um, the organization did some studies to control for factors, right? Because people dismiss those. Those are all, you know, those are sort of. Uh, those aren't controlling for factors, but even when you control for factors, so observable factors like majors, occupations, work hours, there's still an unexplained uh, wage gap based on race and gender, and it's worse when it's intersecting, right? When you have race and gender intersecting, you make less per, uh, per dollar than white men. And we talked about three major factors in that, although it's complicated um, because there's a lot of things, which I'll explain at the end. Um, first is obviously direct discrimination arising from bias and stereotypes. So offering someone m less money because they are a woman or a woman of color, not, uh, not having access to promotions, getting less in, in, in raises, um, all of those are things that contribute to that gap widening. Um, 
but it's also not just direct pay discrimination that impacts the paycheck. So for example, if you've also been su subjected to sexual harassment and have to jump career paths or take something lower to flee a bad situation, um, that impacts your pay. Or if you've had pregnancy discrimination or caregiver discrimination, um, or if you don't have paid family medical um, or sick leave, um, very important now, people are finally talking about paid leave um, and why it's important and connecting it. Um, and so. It's unfortunate it takes, a, it takes a um, pandemic for people to understand why these things are important. Um, but all of those can, can be our factors in the wage gap. Um, two other major things are, I, I've alluded to this twice already, occupational segregation. That is, in nearly every occupational field, we see women relegated to certain jobs um, in greater numbers than men. And of course, where the women are relegated and women of color, there um, are lower that those are traditionally lower paying jobs. And so again, that overall wage gap number, that looks at the fact that you know, two thirds of, of, of people in um, minimum wage jobs are, are women, or it's looking at the fact that um, you know, you've got, um, you know, women are nurses and they're lower paid and men are doctors and they're higher paid. So there's occupational segregation that's also happening. Um, and you know, people will say, despite, arguments to the contrary, women are not drawn to lower paying fields because they want less pay, and that's a shocker. Um, and um, women don't want to be paid less when they're sitting next to someone doing the same job. Um, but again, I keep coming back to this theme that I think that the work that women do is valued less because women do those jobs. Um, and then the third major factor that we've examined, and these are, does not mean these three are exclusive, are something that we call the, the motherhood penalty, and you've probably heard about this. Right now, working mothers, on average, makes around 69 cents on the dollar as compared to working fathers. Um, and that's in due because of cultural stereotypes about women's commitment to work, um, whether, whether they have spent time out of the workforce or not. Um, and then there are some experimental studies that show um, employers are less likely to, to hire mothers um, than they actually are to hire women without children. Um, and, and one of the interesting phenomena about this is that fathers, in contrast, um, don't suffer a penalty. In fact, they, uh, when, they, when they have children, in fact, they, uh, it looks like they receive higher wages um, after having a child, which is called the fatherhood bonus. <laughs> so, um, so, so these stereotypes about what to expect about women, what employers think are women's roles, um, factor all into the to the wage gap, but I will also say that, um, as I mentioned before, there are other things that might not be direct contributors, but play a role like sexual harassment, barriers to educational attainment, and certainly lack of unionization. You, you know, your, your pay um, overall, if you're looking at places that are unionized and places that aren't, the pay is gonna be, is gonna be um, higher. And then I'll just end by saying there are also employer practices that make things worse that can then also contribute to the wage gap. So um, I'll just give one example, which is the practice of using prior salary to set your current wages, right? So this sounds innocuous enough. We've all, every one of us has gone into a job and they're like, what was your last pay? And then you're like, okay, well we can negotiate 10% over that or whatever it is. Well, the problem is if you're, I've just talked about how your wages may be tainted by discrimination. If you go into a new employer, even a well-intentioned employer, uh, if your prior wages have been tainted by discrimination and they're just giving you a set percentage over that, then they are carrying forward discrimination into your next job and it follows you for the rest of your life and in your social security and in your benefits. Um, your retirement benefits. And so the idea is that you don't peg wages to people's prior jobs, you peg them to the job. Another groundbreaking concept, but um, uh, so, so that's just an example of something that can then just continue that wage gap going over time. And Nicole, maybe you could talk about um, some laws that might be helpful in enacting in order to structural problems and, and help um, lift women out of poverty. Um, so um, you may have heard the various Democratic presidential candidates, and now there are fewer as of a few hours ago than there were yesterday even. Um, yeah. Um, uh, all of them really have been talking about changes to labor law as part of uh, their economic justice platform. And um, 
uh, without uh, taking too much credit, because I think all the unions are working to push the, the candidates toward um, uh, seeking change in labor law, because we all recognize that it's really broken. And what I talked about earlier about the brokenness of the law is really only uh, the tip of the iceberg. Um, uh, my union, SEIU, is pushing a campaign that we call Unions for All. And the idea is that every worker in America, regardless of the kind of worker she, work she does, should have a right to form a union. It shouldn't be that only 46% of workers are covered, and it shouldn't be that when you try to form a union, you're faced with um, a virulent anti-union campaign that uh, unfortunately often prevails. And so um, the promise of this idea of Unions for All is that um, all workers should be able to um, have an avenue to identify shared concerns and have a collective voice and and really demand remedies so that we can effect widespread change. And so when we talk about the changes that we would like to see, there are really four things that I'll say quickly. Um, the first is that instead of bargaining the way we do in the United States where each workplace, literally workplace by workplace, workers have to form a union, um, what we believe is that we should have what's called sectoral bargaining. And this is the way workers bargain in other parts of the world, in Europe, um, in Australia, in New Zealand, um, in many part places in South America, where the entire workforce in a sector is organized into a union. So that, for example, let's take nurses, because Deborah mentioned nurses is one area where there's pay and equity. Um, which is crazy because there's a shortage of nurses. So why is, there, where, why is there such a big pay gap and why are nurses paid so little when we actually have a shortage in the United States of nurses? You'd think that if you have a shortage based on economic principles of supply and demand, the wages would be higher, but that's actually not the case. Um, in unionized workplaces, um, nurses do get paid quite well and have good wages and benefits and health care and retirement. Um, but unfortunately, most places in the United States, um, nurses are not unionized. And so the idea of sectoral bargaining is that, is, is that it would take, um, if all nurses around the country were in a union, then wages would be taken out of competition. In other words, there would no longer be a battle between the hospital on one corner against the hospital on, across the street where the hospital that's unionized and paying workers a wage that they can actually live on and have a life with dignity, own a house, pursue the American dream would not be in competition with the hospital across the street where the nurses are paid substandard wages. And this is, I can take an example of a campaign that I worked on in Pittsburgh where there's two big hospital systems, the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center and Allegheny Medical Center. Allegheny is a unionized workforce and UPMC is anti-union and fights the union. Um, and both of them, by the way, nonprofit organizations where they're, um, but UPMC workers are paid um, uh, very low wages and don't have a union. And Allegheny has a union and the workers are paid more. Well, Allegheny and UPMC get the same Medicaid reimbursement rates, they get the same Medicare reimbursement rates. So Allegheny is put at an economic disadvantage. So the idea of structural bargaining or structural representation um, is that or workers are organized by industry and by geography. And this, again, is the standard practice in most of the rest of the developed world, but here, um, not the case. So it makes it very difficult under our system um, to have to, for workers to form a union. The second thing um, is that in this country, we have something called preemption, which you may have learned about already in your classes, but the National Labor Relations Act actually preempts states and localities from innovating in the area of workers' rights. Um, so while you could have a higher minimum wage in a place where um, the, the uh, you know, in a place where the minimum wage is raised, you, know, you all know that our federal minimum wage is painfully low at $7.25 an hour, and we've been pushing in the 515 for, to raise the minimum wage across the country, and we've been largely successful in places where there's, we have progressive politics. Well, in the area of labor law, states and localities are not allowed to innovate. And so you cannot have the kind of laboratory of ideas that you have in other areas of the law. And so it's our view that labor laws, like in other areas of employment law, whether it's discrimination or workplace health and safety, in those areas you can have states and localities actually have higher protections than the federal floor. And so we believe that in labor law as well, states and localities should be able to protect workers more than the federal floor provides under the National Labor Relations Act. So that's the second change that we would like to see. The third thing is that, as you probably know, a lot of the jobs in this country are actually funded by taxpayer dollars. And that's jobs in healthcare, that's jobs in, um, a lot of jobs in, um, 
law enforcement, security, um, obviously military jobs. A lot of the jobs that people do are funded by taxpayer dollars. And we believe that every taxpayer dollar should be spent on good union jobs. Taxpayers should not be funding poverty jobs. And today, they are. Workers who work in healthcare, many of them are actually, not only do they are their jobs funded by Medicaid, they themselves are eligible for Medicaid because they earn so little money that the, and, and they don't, they're not able to afford healthcare. So I'm giving an example of home care workers or nursing home workers. Those workers earn so little that their poverty wages are below the level that, um, um, and makes them Medicaid eligible. So we believe that every government contract, every government job, whether they're directly government jobs or contracted by the government should be good union jobs. And finally, you know, you hear all these, these candidates talking about these amazing plans, whether it's the Green New Deal or free college education or health care for all. We hear candidates in the Democratic primary talking about these great plans. Those plans require a lot of tax, again, a lot of dollars to go, for example, to change our economy to a green economy. That's gonna be a lot of new jobs, and those jobs should be good jobs, well-paying jobs, and union jobs. Just like the jobs that were in steel and coal of our grandparents' generation, they, were, they became good jobs because they were union jobs. Um, the jobs of the green era need to be good jobs that pay a living wage and where workers have a voice on the job. So those are, I think, four things that um, we believe would create structural change and shift the balance of power between um, um, workers and employers and ultimately bring up uh, women's and families' standard of living because, as Deborah said, so many women today work in uh, low-wage jobs that are um, really poverty jobs and, and, the, and the difference um, I actually have some numbers around the union difference. The difference, um, the union members make 15% more for the same job as non-union workers, and the pay gap, it's not only that all union workers make more, the pay gap between women and men is much smaller in, in a unionized workforce. So um, the gap is um, still exists, but it's much smaller in a unionized workforce than in a non-union workforce. Thank you. Um, so that's sort of the, the labor law framework. Um, Deborah, can you talk about the federal employment law um, sure. options for laws that possibly could help um, minimize the pay equity and pay, pay gap? Sure. And women. there's a women. There's a long list. <laughs> but I will just talk about a couple. And I will also note you're totally right about preemption. Because while a lot of the things, I'm going to talk about federal laws. And while a lot of those are stuck in Congress, it is true that on the employment front, um, states have been the incubators of change and have been moving forward. And right now, every state has an equal pay law, some stronger than the federal and some not, but except for, I think, one state is left. I can't remember now if it's Alabama or Mississippi, but one there's 49 states that have um, equal pay laws. Um, so there's so basically, the, the, the first um, uh, equal pay law was the Equal Pay Act of 19, the first one that had teeth was the Equal Pay Act of 1963, and that amended actually the Fair Labor Standards Act. Um, and then later there was um, Title VII of the, the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Um, we've learned a lot over time since that, you know, so the decades since then about how um, discrimination operates in the workplace. And while those are incredibly important laws, and those are the laws that we are still suing under now, um, uh, I don't want to say that if you're facing some kind of problem that you can't have your rights remedied under these laws. That's not what I'm saying at all. But there's been a couple things. We've learned more things that we can fix through the law since that time. And courts have weakened some of the uh, provisions and mechanisms in bringing these cases. And so we are trying to do both things, both uh, remedy uh, what's been weakened, um, expand what we can expand and identify new tactics that we can fix through the law. So there's a, I, I mentioned in the opening that I led the, um, the Paycheck Fairness Act Coalition. Uh, and that, that was primarily to pass the Paycheck Fairness Act, which would amend the 1963 um, Equal Pay Act. Um, it would strengthen in a variety of ways. I can talk about a couple provisions, but, but it, would, it would go after, for example, one of the things I mentioned before, it would um, stop the use of prior salary history in setting wages and setting your pay. So we know that's a new tactic people hadn't thought about necessarily before, and that would, um, that would close up that loophole. Um, the 
in many workplaces, it's gotten better because of an Obama era executive order and some provisions in um, some labor laws. But you are still can, you still can be fired for talking about your wages at work in many um, in many jobs. I think this generation will not stand that for very long. It was different when you know when I was coming up and you didn't talk about wages with anybody. But employers also can fire you and have what we call punitive pay policies for that. Um, there are some protections in labor law, but it's not, it's not enough. And there's an executive order, but it's not enough. So this would allow people to um, talk about their wages um, uh, without fear of, of being fired. And it also, um, right now, you can receive a lot more remedies. Uh, you can receive more damages if you bring, this is very unexpected, if you bring a race discrimination case than you can if you bring a gender discrimination case. And this would um, equalize those remedies. There's a bunch of other things. It would close up some of the defenses so that employers couldn't use any excuse for paying men and women differently. So that the Paycheck Fairness Act is passed three times in the House of Representatives, and it's stuck in the in the Senate. Um, I will also say another some of the other reforms we need again on on Title VII. Um, I mentioned again in the opening the Civil Rights Act of 1991, which set damages. Um, which have not changed since 1991. Um, so you've got a cap on damages of $300,000, and um, this is extremely, extremely low. There's legislation that has been put forward in the past to get rid of that cap. None of these things are moving forward. Um, I've talked about occupational segregation. This is a harder one to, to uh, wrangle with, but there's legislation called the Fair Pay Act that would say jobs of equivalent uh, worth should be paid equally. So, for example, um, fire um, f uh, fire dispatchers, right? So, when you call for uh, when you call uh, people who dispatch the, the fire engines to go to fires, they make more money than the nine one one dispatchers. What's the difference? Well, fire dispatchers are usually men. Nine one one operators are usually women. They are paid differently, um, and so this would be an example of how you could start um, looking at different across different jobs to pay the same because they're not the same job. Um, and also, uh, we need reforms to how we bring class actions. That's also um, it was uh, there was a case called Walmart, um, Walmart versus Dukes, which I worked on, and that sort of um, really hurt the ability to to vindicate your rights in a. Uh, in a uh, to join together to vindicate your rights in class actions for employment matters. So um, those are some of the things. Yeah, and could you just um, explain what the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act is oh. and how that also sort of helps actually? Um, sure. Women. Yes. So um, the 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 Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. I I didn't talk about any of the victories. I've been just talking gloom and doom. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, so that case, look, that case was really important, um, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to try to talk fast, so I'm not using up all of your time. But the main reason it was important is not because it gave women significant tools to bring new cases. What it did was it pierced the public consciousness about equal pay, mm -hmm. and that was a purposeful thing that we went about doing in the same way that Me Too has pierced your public, like your consciousness. 10 years ago, 13 years ago, it was equal pay. Most people had thought this issue was happened, was do, done and dusted in the, the 60s and 70s, but it was her case that made equal pay, even if, even if you haven't heard her name, um, a front burner issue. And basically what happened in that case is um, the Supreme Court overturned decades of law of, of what your time limit was to bring cases. If you were getting a paycheck that was tainted by discrimination, every time you got a paycheck, your statute of limitations clock renewed. You would have 180 days because you were still being discriminated against. The court said, no, no, no. It's when the employer decides to discriminate. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm not sure your employer tells you when they are discriminating so that you know when your clock starts running to bring a case. And in fact, in her case, she had been discriminated against in pay for 20 years and only found out because someone slipped her an anonymous note. And they slipped her an anonymous note because they, had a, um, uh, they weren't allowed to talk about wages at work. So that person was scared to be fired. So they slipped her an anonymous note. She found out 20 years later that she'd lost out on those wages, brought a case, lost at the Supreme Court on a technicality about this statute of limitations period. So, so a group of us banded together to work on federal legislation, which we, which was another amazing story for another time, but we got that passed. They're making a movie about it. Um, but they, we got that passed, and 
All it did though was, it's not all, but what it did was just reset that the law so that your statute of limitations then runs when you get a discriminatory paycheck. So it didn't give women new tools, but it made people talk and care about the issue. And then after that, Lily started working with us to get the Paycheck Fairness Act passed, which is the new tools that we need. Okay, great. Um, Nicole, moving into um, sort of more union um, and collective bargaining um, issues, can you speak to um, sort of the impediments of uh, people current impediments of people to unionize and, and, and you know there's been some things that the Trump administration has done um, in terms of whether you can contribute your union dues through your Medicaid payments right um, and also collect fees from non-members and how that um, is really an impediment to people trying to unionize yeah so the um, I talked about the really precipitous decline in the percentage of American workers who are represented by unions, and that's taken place, that's not new. Um, and it's also not inevitable. Some people say that um, we don't really have strong unions in this country anymore because of outsourcing or because of globalization. Um, but really, the, the decline of union, union, unions in this country is, it was an intended result of decades of pressure by politicians you know, on politicians, by corporations, and the wealthy to attack workers' rights. Um, I talked about the National Labor Relations Act and how, from the get-go, it ex excluded large swaths of our economy, whether it's domestic workers or agricultural workers. Um, but even that law has been significantly eroded by intervening court decisions, um, amendments to the law, and how it's been applied by the agency that's meant to protect workers' rights. Um, I actually just came here today from a, um, a conference of the American Bar Association of lawyers who um, are both management side and union side lawyers in labor law, and the members of the National Labor Relations Board came to speak to us yesterday, and um, there are supposed to be five members of the National Labor Relations Board, three appointed by the president from her or his uh, party, and two by the minority, and today there are three Republican members of the National Labor Relations Board. There are no Democrats on the board today. Um, and all three of them were um, had decades of experience um, being management side lawyers and essentially engaging in union busting professionally. That was their job, and now they're doing it on behalf of the federal government. Um, and so um, in the area of interpretation of the law, the uh, Trump appointees to the board have systematically dismantled all of the achievements of the um, Obama era board and gone even further than that to engage in affirmative attacks on unions and on workers. Um, I want to give, I'll, I'll talk about the two examples that um, you mentioned. The first actually, oddly, um, was a rule promulgated by the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services, um, which is part of Health and Human Services. Um, and um, what CMS did was issue a rule that uh, would make it, would forbid medic home care workers from deducting union dues from their pay. In other words, just to explain, um, you know when you get a paycheck, there are all sorts of deductions from your paycheck, right? Your taxes get deducted, sometimes your health benefits, sometimes a transportation benefit, you can deduct to your 401k if you have that ability. There are deductions that come from your pay. Well, when you're in a union, um, one of the things you're able to do is, is check a box on your union card that allows your union dues to go directly from your pay to your union um, so that you're able to support the organization that supports you. Well, what the Trump administration did was pass a rule through, um, believe it or not, through the Medicaid system that said home care workers, even though every other worker in America is allowed to do this, home care workers are not allowed to do it. And they took this arcane um, law called the Medicaid reassignment rule which was intended to prevent folks from taking Medicaid dollars that are supposed to provide care for poor people and um, disabled people in this country and reassigning those dollars to something else, essentially in order to prevent fraud. Well, the Trump administration said the Medicaid reassignment rule is also applies to union home care workers and, and is preventing, trying to prevent them from um, from deducting uh, union dues from their pay. Well, the good thing is that even though the administration promulgated this rule, the states are actually refusing to implement it. Mm -hmm. So, um, and this, what the states are saying is, 
essentially this rule doesn't really apply to us um, because we have a different kind of payroll system. And so to date, even though the effort was made by the administration to deprive a half a million workers of their ability to participate in their union, they have not yet been successful. And actually um, that uh, rule is being, is tangled up in litigation that is being brought by about eight different states um, against the administration and so far so good, uh, they have won um, in, the, in the courts and um, at the state level. So another reason why states should be allowed to innovate also. Um, the second attack, um, you may have heard a case that was decided, um, I guess just about a year and a half ago, um, called Janus versus AFSCME. Um, and that case reversed 40 years of precedent um, uh, that held that in the public sector, so I've been talking a lot about private sector workers, workers who work for private employers. Well, in the public sector, um, uh, Janice just imp was about public sector workers. And in the public sector, the vast majority of workers are, are women. So think about teachers, um, uh, courtroom. I mean, I know for SEIU, for example, we represent people in um, s municipalities, in counties, and it's the state level who do all the public services that you encounter every day, whether it's going to the DMV or going to um, a courthouse and, and accessing public services. Most public sector workers are women. Um, and, what, and that's why Janice is really, was really a women's rights case, frankly. Um, what the court said in Janice is that um, although the union is required to provide representation of every single worker in the workforce, once the union represents those workers, um, no worker should be required to pay anything for those services. Um, previously, it had been the rule that if you want to be a union member, you pay dues, and, you, and you're part of the union, and you get to vote on the contract, and you get to vote for your leaders. But even if you don't want to be a member, you still have to pay a fee, what we call a fair share fee, because you're paying your fair share to the union um, to pay for the services that the union provides you as somebody in the bargaining unit. So the union negotiates a collective bargaining agreement on behalf of everyone. The union represents everyone in the grievance process that I talked about earlier. And so non-members would be, um, in, in many states, um, would be required to pay a fee for those services that the union provides. Well, what the Supreme Court said, and it, this was a 5-4 a, a decision, um, like many of the more the m very controversial decisions of the past 20 years that are decided by a single vote of a single justice, the court said that it's unconstitutional, that it violates the freedom of association of non-members to be forced to pay money to the union to, to, for the services that the union provides. Um, what we said in that case is we're required all the time in our society to pay for things through our tax system that we might not believe in. Right? We're all paying taxes for perhaps to pay for wars that we wouldn't have believed in or to pay for certain ac actions of the government that we wouldn't choose to pay for. But that's the way our system of democracy works, that uh, once there's an elected representative and the government is representing all of us, we contribute toward that system. Um, well, the Supreme Court in Janus um, overturned, like I said, 40 years of precedent that had upheld over and over and over um, the notion that a union can collect fair share fees from non-members. And so what that did for public sector unions, and um, like I mentioned at the beginning, we represent about a million public sector workers in this country um, between SEIU and the teachers unions and the unions represent, representing other public sector workers like AFSCME, which was the um, defendant in that case. Um, we no longer can collect a fee from non-members. So every single person who is represented by the union needs to sign a union card and agree voluntarily to pay membership dues. Well, if you've taken economics, um, you know that there's something called a free rider problem. Um, and um, that concept says that if you can get something for free, the exact same thing for free that you don't, that you can get if you pay for it, well, most people, many people are gonna choose not to pay. Um, and so after Janus, um, there was a pretty significant hit on public sector unions. Um, and, and that wasn't a coincidence because public sector unions actually are one of the major forces um, in this country in mobilizing people to get to the polls, in educating people about how democracy works and how voting works um, and about their rights to, to vote and to participate in their democracy. Public sector unions also train people in how to do public speaking and how to talk to their friends about politics. And so 
Um, this concerted attack on unions and particularly on public sector unions has really been part of an attack, a bigger attack on working people um, and on low income folks to try to um, uh, really take away their rights to participate in democracy. And I would say that the um, decision in Janus, I, I sort of put it in a line with the decision attacking the Voting Rights Act, with, the, with Citizens United, with Bush v. Gore. There are these decisions, they're all 5-4, and they have one after another work to shrink the rights of um, really of working people and in, in participating in our democracy and, and Janice was part of that and and in the um, prior to um, uh, uh, Janice there was a case called Friedrichs which um, was argued right before Justice Scalia died and then was decided 4-4 so therefore the lower court decision was um, upheld um, and before that um, was another case. These, these are sort of these building block cases that have really been driven by um, Justice Alito, who seems to have um, uh, unions in his sight lines. But um, um, the Obama administration had actually taken the opposite view, that fair share fees were constitutional. And, um, and every prior uh, administration had taken that position in court. Frankly, both Republican and Democratic justices had voted the same way on this issue. Um, uh, Scalia himself had ups, upheld fair share fees in prior cases, um, but the Trump administration flipped the, uh, the, the position in the case and ultimately um, we lost that case 5-4 um, and it has had a huge impact on the labor movement. Thank you. I think we have about five minutes left or so, so maybe we could open it up to um, Q&A from the audience if anyone has any questions. I don't have any notes on it. I don't think we, I don't know if we did no cards, so maybe just raise, raise your hand. Did, yeah. Hi, I don't know if I should ask this, but uh, you talked about how if you tell an employer what you made previously, to if you tell a new employer what you made previously, they'll offer you um, a salary based off that. Um, so what I was wondering is, what if you don't tell them the truth? What if you, what if you tell them what you really want to make and then they jump use that as a jumping off point? Is there any way they can confirm with your old employer? Yes. Damn. So so let me back up. So not all employers. Well, first a good lawyer will tell you don't lie, don't ever lie, right? Not a good idea, especially in an employment context. For then you know you can get fired for most anything, right? Um, so not all employers will use your prior salary as a jumping off period, but you will often be asked that question and then that can be used in the negotiations that the employer has to decide what to give you. Things are changing. We are seeing salary ranges. We are seeing people not ask that question. Um, so, and then there is, uh, there is uh, you know, federal law and that is pending that would then prohibit it um, altogether. So the, you know, there's a variety of different ways to do this. My old employer had a salary negotiation course where, you know, you could negotiate and make sure and give you different tactics to not answer or try to get around it. Some employers are saying no negotiation at all. Um, some people are coming in and just saying what their salary expectations are. There's different things. The, the hard thing is that employers control the information. And unless they're telling you a salary range, then you're kind of just guessing exactly where to peg things, which leads often to a factor that contributes to the wage gap. So if they don't ask you directly, you don't need to answer it. You could just say what you, uh, you could ask them what the range should be, and then you could make your best argument for why you should be at the top of that range based on your uh, experience. And I, I actually want to respond to something Deborah said about at, talking about your discussion. wages. Discussion, they are... That conversation is protected by Section 7 of the National Labor Relations Act. You are allowed to talk to your coworkers about your wages. That is protected. Even if your employer tells you you're not allowed to, you are allowed to. And but you not can, if you're a manager, which and you, happened to Lily Ledbetter. That, that is true. Yeah. But you can that file an unfair labor practice charge if you get disciplined for doing that. And um, uh, unfortunately, the remedies aren't very great, but, it is, <laughs> but the right is protected.
Yeah, I mean, that's why it's so important for states to be able to innovate and to be able to pass laws that are more protective than the federal floor, because that's how change has been made. That's so many of the laws at the federal level that we've, whether it's the Fair Labor Standards Act or OSHA or all these, the, they were st started at the local level and then moved to the federal level. Um, and to be able to innovate above that floor is something that we would like to be able to do in the context of workers' rights as well. And I think, if I remember correctly, that, that New Jersey was one of these situations where we had been fighting with, to get an equal pay law you know, passed, and then when the governor, when the parties flipped, then it was one of the first things on the agenda. And then it went through, yes. Yeah, that's Debbie, that's Debbie Katz, she's speaking tonight, so you'll come back and see her tonight, but um, yeah. I, so I'll just tell, um, so SEIU has spearheaded the Fight for 15, and as I mentioned, the main target of the campaign has been fast food um, shops, although it's also been adjunct professors who, believe it or not, also live in poverty, um, and airport workers and childcare workers and other workers who um, struggle to make uh, ends meet in our country. Um, and um, the, the McDonald's workers, what's interesting is when we started talking to McDonald's and other fast food workers about their lives and their jobs, which um, is one thing union organizers do, is talk to workers about their experiences at work, uh, we learned that many fast food workers experience terrible sexual harassment um, and often assault um, in their workplaces. And I mentioned earlier, it's often really hard for individual low-wage workers to get a lawyer to represent them. And so um, the fast food workers started joining together, and um, in September of 2018, uh, the fast food workers around the country, uh, as part of the Fight for 15, held the first ever nationwide strike about the issue of sexual harassment. And this was, you know, it came on the heels of the Me Too movement and really the breaking open of this issue in the public um, light, but you, that movement was largely led, initially at least, by women who were, had, were quite famous, actresses, um, movie stars who um, had a lot of notoriety and frankly the ability to come forward and um, not risk everything for their, certainly taking a risk, um, but not risking economic security, homelessness, um, et cetera, for their families. And um, so the fast food workers started organizing around the issue of sexual harassment, and in 2019, dozens of McDonald's employees filed simultaneous complaints with the EEOC um, about the harassment they had endured. They um, filed these lawsuits um, all in the same, or they filed these EEOC complaints all in the same day to really shine a light on, um, on the issue of sexual harassment for low-wage workers. And, and I would say without the Fight for 15, they would not, if you speak to these workers, they would not have filed these complaints. They would not have been able to um, come together in this way. Um, and so it's, again, they don't have a union yet. These workers are not unionized workers. They're part of a movement for change. Um, but they were able through that movement to, um, to act collectively and, um, and seek justice on behalf of all of the workers in their workplace. And I want to just describe this beautiful march, the day the EOC complaints were filed. Um, most of the workers at fast food um, stores are women also, and contrary to the sort of mythology, I'm sure you all know this, but contrary to the mythology that it's like a teenage job that people do for extra bucks in the summer, um, these are jobs that people do to um, feed their children. Um, and. Um, when the complaints were filed, there was a march to McDonald's headquarters in Chicago, and the men in the, in the movement said, we're going to let the women lead, and they stood back, and the women went forward, and they literally said, we have your backs, and the women marched to McDonald's headquarters and brought with them copies of their um, EEOC complaints that they had filed with the agency and demanded that the CEO and the other executives of McDonald's come out and take the, the complaints in their hands. And what was so incredible was not that they won. There's going to be a long time before any of them even get to court or win a case or see any um, compensation. But the power of these women being able to stand up together and, and talk about what happened to them um, was quite incredible. And it really galvanized um, the women 
from all of the stores to stand up and, um, and try to make a difference at their workplace on their path to unionization. Is there still time? Okay. Um, hi, everyone. So I'm writing my note on automation, and uh, one of the things that you had both spoken about was um, occupational segregation. And although there's a lot of controversy as to what will happen with jobs being lost as a result of automation and jobs being created, it seems like there is a general agreement that because of occupational segregation, it's mostly women of color, particularly Latinas, who will end up being displaced. Um, and they are the group of people who tend to not have um, a higher education. And so I was just wondering if there was any work um, uh, that you, Deborah, or Nicole did or are doing um, that explores what could possibly be done to cater to the women who will be in that position. Um, yeah, the, there's a really exciting work being done in California. There's a Future of Work Commission that Governor Gavin Newsom has uh, convened, and our president, Mary Kay Henry, is actually one of the co-chairs of that commission. And um, they're looking at, well, the future of work, hence the name. Um, but um, at how workers, particularly low-wage workers, will be impacted by all of the changes in the workforce in the coming decades. And so, and I think, um, Climate change and the need for um, changing economy around um, whether it's coal or uh, gas and all of the jobs that will be, the new jobs that will be created. Um, we need to have workforce training for the new jobs that will be created. And then in terms of um, automation and AI and the jobs that will go away, you know, I mean, if, if driverless cars really come about, that's nine million workers drive for a living. Um, um, you know, we've been through this before in this country, and there was always kind of this fear in, of, you know, oh, jobs are going to go away when, when the, whether it was the Industrial Revolution or, um, and, and there's always, there are always new jobs created. And I think what's really important is that there be um, training and an understanding that displaced workers, you know, we talk a lot about a just transition. Um, when we talk about um, green, the green economy and that there needs to be a just transition so that workers are trained and able to go into new jobs. And training, education, and making sure that those things are affordable are all part of um, uh, the structural changes we need to have in our economy to make sure that no, nobody's left, left behind as we move toward a new economy. Um, the, and the only thing I would add to that is not exactly, I don't think it directly answers the question um, on the automation part, but as we move into a gig economy, the, or we are in a gig economy. Someone has to show me how to use Uber to get out of here at the way I don't know how to do it because I'm old. Um, but the, um, one of the things that's interesting because there's like a debate going on, like in employment discrimination circles, because it gives, some people gives flexibility, right? We've been asking employers for flexibility um, for scheduling and this, but then some of the discrimination laws won't apply to people as they are, you know, taking on these different types of sectors of work and so, what does that mean about the future? And so that's, I've been, so some of those things like coverage and protection and, and how you vindicate rights and that's going to look different in this modern uh, workforce. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't even talk about misclassification, which is a whole other thing. Or joint employers yeah. or, or <laughs> independent contractors who are not covered right. by Title VII and all kinds of things. So it's um, not exactly on point, but it's implicated by it. Sectoral bargaining, I just had a question. Um, how do you account for like differences in um, cost of living like across the country? Because it's obviously very um, wide ranging, especially in the United States. So I was just curious. Yeah, so in um, the, the plan for this, the sectoral bargaining law that we're hoping to get passed <laughs> when we went back um, our country, um, would account for geographic differences based on um, economic differences in different places. So even, say, for example, within New York, um, in the New York metropolitan area, there would be different wages than in upstate New York where the cost of living is lower. So yeah, and that's something that is done in the rest of the world where there's sectoral bargaining. Um, there's a project that was just um, launched by um, the Work Labor Center at Harvard Law School called the Clean Slate Project, 
where they came out with a report and recommendation around uh, reforms to labor law in the United States. They, it's called the Clean Slate Project because they started with a clean slate and then tried to envision what a, work, what a law would look like if it really was a law that was to protect all workers. And they talk a lot in that uh, report and recommendation, um, which you can find online, about sectoral bargaining and how it works. I wanna, before we close, can I just put in a plug that, um, I don't know if you, um, any of you are interested in becoming labor lawyers or union side lawyers, but um, uh, I, I said to Deborah and I were talking about this on the way over that I actually think I have the best lawyer job in the world. Um, <laughs> and I used to think being on the Supreme Court would be better, but I don't think that anymore. Um, but I really do get to do work that I believe in and represent people that I um, admire. And um, every day I feel like I go to work and make the world a better place. And um, we have clerkships and fellowships at SEIU um, for law students in the summer and during the year. And um, also we have fellowships for post-law school. Um, there's a fellowship called the Peggy Browning Fellowship, which is a summer uh, fellowship to work um, in a union or um, uh, at a union side law firm. And I highly uh, encourage any of you that are considering it to um, consider it seriously and feel free to contact me um, if you're interested in chatting about it more. But I, um, one of the things I'm very committed to is a new generation of union side and workers' rights lawyers. If, if we're going to end with plugs. Um, <laughs> the only thing I will say is I didn't get a talk at all, and that's fine, about my, my current job, which is in domestic violence. And there is a, we have a whole project on economic justice. And the, the through line for all of this is so that economic empowerment is not just about equality in achieving equality in the workforce, it's also about survival, right? So it's survival, it's being able to have enough money to get out of bad situations, it's being able to be equal and, and be able to support yourself. And so there's a through line to all this. And, and, I, and I will just also say the, the same thing, like my favorite class by far and away in law school was uh, employment discrimination. So if you haven't taken it, take it. Um, not, not doing any chilling for Rutgers for their classes, but I just love it. And um, and it's it's it, you never know where it will take you. I, I took the class in my law school, and that um, that professor then hired me at his law firm, and it you know sort of set the set the course for the rest of my life. So. Well, I want to thank the panelists, uh, Deborah and Nicole, for a great conversation, and 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 thank you also for all the important work that you guys. Have. And with this, we're going to be concluding um, the daytime panels today. Um, so I just wanted to thank you all for joining us for today's panels um, of the Women's Rights Law Reporters 50th Anniversary Symposium. Um, I would like to thank our wonderful panels, panelists uh, here today and the ones who were in the morning sessions um, and the wonderful moderators that we had uh, here, here professors at Rutgers Law School. Um, we, we had amazing dynamic conversations surrounding issues of reproductive justice, um, the rights of the incarcerated immigrant detainees and all criminal justice involved folks, as well as the socioeconomic inequalities we just talked about uh, for marginalized populations, uh, women and the intersection of that. Um, in the current legal world, it is easy to want to give up. There are so many issues out there that all these panelists uh, laid out for us. Uh, when we hear the headlines and talking about how the administration is detaining asylum seekers um, or how the Supreme Court is about to rule on um, you know, the resurgence of trap laws in Louisiana, uh, it is easy to become numb and stop fighting. Um, as lawyers, we have a responsibility to keep fighting, though. Uh, to think critically about the rules proposed by the powers that be and to make a difference for our clients, uh, whether those people are the incarcerated domestic violence victims um, or healthcare workers seeking to unionize. Um, speakers, thank you so much for re-inspiring us to keep moving forward uh, against the struggle for injustice. And please join us tonight for a reception at 7 o'clock. Um, it's going to be hosted in 15 Washington's Great Hall. Um, we will be having uh, keynote speaker uh, Deborah Katz uh, to right here <laughs> uh, talk about uh, her, her work as being the civil rights attorney of the year and, and, and the legal branch of the Me Too movement. So we're so excited and please join us then. Thank you. Oh, it's the
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah, we have a picture. Except this shirt of the yeah, for this year. Yeah, every every year gets to uh, design their own. So we'll be that is great. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. Coming down. Would you picture a nice picture of everybody? Yeah. Yeah. A nice picture. Or you take it? Yeah. Oh, take it. No, I'll jump in. Yeah.
No, 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 it might need to go to my, I don't get to keep it. It might go to my organization. If it goes to me, then it's like income that I have to pay taxes on it. I just give it to my You know what? What I'll do is I will ask our finance person, and then I can I don't know what they'll tell me. I think it had to be to NNEDV, so I don't keep it. So you want to, oh, but I don't want to, I'm not trying to be ungrateful. It's more like I'm no, giving it yeah. to my organization. Oh, yeah. Totally, yeah. Um, um, and we could do a self Don't avoid it yet, because that'll cost you money to avoid. So I want you to, yeah. right, like it'll cost 30 bucks or something for you guys. Wait, I can just give it back to you and you can be ripped off. Right. Exactly. But let me just ask what we okay. should do, and okay. then I can mail it back to you. I will keep both, don't worry. You don't have to, I'm not trying to <laughs> take advantage. Can I borrow you? Okay. I'll do a picture of Thank you. Okay. 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 Good luck, we leave to look. Our outfits match. <laughs> we have our pearls and our blue I was trying to get, let me see. Actually, it'd be easier with that, the physical side. Okay. 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 Yeah. But the glare is a lot. Okay. Just go with the shoes. Shoes? Oh. Okay. Okay. I have all my walking shoes. No problem. One, two, three. Let me know. And you can find me on LinkedIn or, yeah. Let me see who I can engage about that. You know, I think she's the editor in chief, maybe, the woman who spoke at the end. So yeah, she I'll probably, yeah. Thank you. Enjoy you tonight. Enjoy tonight. Um, um,
Youngjin, is there anything with the computer service that asks us to do for them? Or are they going to come pick it up? Is there anything that the computer service asks us to do with it? He said he'll come down close to 3. Oh, okay. Okay. See, because cause, yeah, cause he has other stuff set up. I don't want to like mess anything up. You, you usually have to tell me to pack it up, but I'm just going to like disconnect everything and make sure the rest. Find out. I can in memory. <laughs> Yeah, I don't have the paperwork for this. Do you want to know what you did? 